Welcome to the Trevor Tysman Show. Today, we are going to be discussing fasting, intermittent fasting, our relationship with calorie deficits, and kind of get into the ins and outs of what I've found to training young athletes as well as uh, a couple hundred clients tracking everything they do. Uh, so let's dive into it. Um, yeah. We've got a, you know, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of misinformation, and a, an awful lot of, uh, I would say, parallels between different dieting styles that really kind of are the same exact thing. That when you get on that hill, people are ride or die by the yes. concept, and it, I find it to be one of the crazy things. Um, you know, do you have any experience? I know that uh, we've talked about you've used you you like to use it or lose it app rather than my fitness pal but you've kind of mm-hmm. had a little bit of teeter tottering with this stuff haven't you Yeah so I, I mean every year I like to stay in the same general weight and and I and I monitor it and so like every year I'm within about 10 pounds of my ideal weight I want to be at about 170 and so during most of the year I build up to about 180 and then the end of winter and into spring I cut back down to 170 so every year I'm doing a cut and every year I'm, I'm experimenting and seeing which ways work and which ways don't and um, are different foods effective. And, and I've found that for me, and, and I think it does extrapolate to other people as well, but for me, um, the basics of calorie in, calorie out are absolutely true. It's just can I stand the calories in being reduced by whatever range I'm trying to reduce it by. Right. And I think, you know, that that goes to show a lot of the, the correlations, you know, I think of intermittent fasting oftentimes is whatever the rage is. You know, you had Atkins mm-hmm. several years ago was all the rage. Now De- we call it keto. Decades ago. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. yeah. And then you call it keto and it kind of everything reinvents itself. But I guess to like get on track of specifically a topic, what really boosted all of this was I did a 37 hour fast. Mm-hmm. And when you do a 37 hour fast, it kind of uh, makes you reflect on a lot of things that whether or not you know, what did I know about fitness? What did I, you know, I have a master's in exercise science and nutrition. Right. I've worked with tons and tons of young athletes. And then I ran kind of a boot camp thing for shoot. I don't know, nearly eight or nine years with Mm -hmm. over a hundred or let's see, I think I have 348 clients data sheets for their given amount of time on weight loss and everything. Right. Kind of not, not necessarily controlled and not necessarily randomized, but it's at least it's data. Which well, a know, lot of people don't have. They yeah, don't well, have we the were, data. Yeah, we worked out for two to th- it was three days a week for about six years, and then I backed it off to two days a week when I had my first kid. And um, just with that amount of exercise controlled, then they could do things outside of mm-hmm. it. But it was an awful lot of nutrition talk, trying to get people motivated and actually execute a game plan rather than, you know, it's one thing to say restrict your calories by 500. But if I don't give you any tools to be successful, that was something that I've kind of developed over time of, get on the scale in the morning and the night. It's a good indication that you eat way too much. If your scale at night is five pounds heavier than your morning, you know, you can do a lot of little tricks Mm -hmm. to give yourself in a better position. When you've counted calories on your apps, is that what you find to be the most successful version of controlling your body weight? I think so. There's kind of two parts of that that they get difficult. Uh, First of all, I think we are as, as a whole, we are terrible and I am terrible at estimating my calories very well. And so the calorie counting apps were actually really helpful to me because I felt less like I was estimating. It's really depressing. Right, yeah, (laughs) oh oh, yeah. And when you you pump in the, or even worse, when you scan the the barcode and it pops up and it says that's 800 calories and you go, I was gonna have two of those. Yeah, it's got. I I think one of the biggest things with those calorie count, is it not like shocking literally to Mm -hmm. completely take in over a course of 30 days, how depressing it is of what the line score is that you're eating. Yes. Well, and, and the heart. So as you're talking, like there's all these different ride or die kind of diets that, that people really buy into, which I think says more about psychology than, than the actual like burning of the, the fuels. Um, they all kind of boil down to a calorie restriction that, that I can deal with. So like, for instance, I've done intermittent fasting every time I, I try and drop weight and it works pretty well because it's basically just skipping a meal. It, dri- it drives me nuts to hear about all this magic stuff with intermittent fasting when really it boils down to, hey, Gary, you didn't eat breakfast, so you ate less food. Yeah, you here's know, 600 <laughs> calories you can spread across the rest of the day. Right, right, right. It, it almost leads you to believe sometimes in a you know conspiracy theory world, you're like, are you propping up these types of 
habits so that you can sell 200 calories. Sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted to show my appreciation. Every time you like, subscribe, or even comment on a video, it definitely supports my work, and I just wanted to say thank you. Let's get back to the show. Calorie snacks, is that the whole point of this? Because if you eat five or six meals a day, and you're on a super restricted diet, and you're trying to get body fat to shed off, you literally have to eat two to 300 yeah, calories at every meal. Small. Unless you have properly prepared Tupperware dishes <laughs> everywhere, it's not very easy to mm -mm. eat just 200 calories at a sitting. It's not. It's near impossible. Yep. Uh, I mean, you think about a handful of nuts, you're you're at about 200 calories. You you. I mean, anything that comes processed in a package that's easy to take right now, probably 200 calories. Like, right. That's, you get the 100 calorie snacks and you feel like you're getting half a snack. That's because 200 calories is really more the full snack size. Yeah. So anyway, all that to say, um, I've tried a little bit of, uh, my wife did some keto and it worked well for her because I think there's a whole other aspect that needs to be kind of played with, which is like, what can your gut handle as well? Because there are different people that have different, whether it's genetic abilities to digest certain types of food or not. I mean, you could be prescribing, and I think this happens a lot for people, which is why they're all ride or die. You could prescribe an eating uh, habit or a, a diet plan that just does not jive with the, their guts. And that makes it so that the entire time that they're trying to accomplish this weight loss program, which has worked for 10 other people that you may have given the advice to, it just kills them because... I get cramps or I, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm bloating or any of those things. And it has a lot more to do with like, what is their gut doing versus like, what is the amount of calories doing? Right. Whether or not your stomach can handle those types of foods. And right. I mean, just as easy as lactose. Like there are so many people in the world that cannot do lactose because that's just a genetic thing that their body does not do. I don't do lactose. That means if I have it in my diet plan, I'm going to feel bad. I think one of the things that I've, gathered in experience over time is the idea that one thing works for everybody and how everyone is all one and all these concepts. As I get more and more experience and move through life, does it not seem as though if you would understand that you are in fact special, <laughs> you are different, whatever your genetic makeup is and the things that you can eat that settle well in your stomach, that mm -hmm. is a real thing, you know, yes. and not everybody can eat the same kind of diet plan, but to understand the rules at which work for your body and then manipulate these mm -hmm. types of things and experiment, I think that's probably the most powerful tool. I think of uh, there's been a chain of studies now that have basically shown all these different formats of dieting. All of them work if you stick to them mm -hmm. because the real game you're playing is the calorie game. Let's right. be honest. So, I mean, so if all things are equal and everything has to be, you know, specifically made for you because your body does different things, the one thing that is, has been shown through every study I've looked at to be absolutely consistent is calories in, calories out means something. And that, oh, yeah. that means that if you eat 2,000 calories and you burn 2,000 calories, you stay the same. If you eat 2,500 and you burn 2,000, you go up. And if you eat... 2000 or sorry if you eat 1500 and you burn 2000 you go down now right. 2000 is the like standardized number that people just assume like that's what a standard american should be burning it's not standard like that is not everybody's number and so when you look at studies um like um there's been a, we, we talk about one in a little bit with um, um ian templeman uh, at all when you look through a study it needs to take into account what is this person's like base number Theirs might be 1,800. Theirs might be 2,400. All of those things matter because if you're, um, if you're not learning what your base is and you're just going by an average, you might be shorting yourself too many calories and it makes it so that you're constantly overly hungry. Or you might be giving yourself too many calories thinking you're in a deficit, but you're actually not. That, that's what I found over and over. And when you track everything, I, I think it's almost nuts when you get down – I, I had multiple people come in, they'll, oh, let me see your line score. Let's let's take a look at everything you're eating. And every time you do the math and you look at it, it is the most perfect, perfectly placed item. And all it takes is a couple questions. Right. So you, you ate just four ounces of meat every single night this week? Man, that is spot on. Four ounces. Just <sighs> did you weigh it every no, I don't have a scale. Okay, well, um, was it about the size of the palm of your hand? Well, no. They they sell it. I guess they sell it in eight ounces at the butcher. 
in in high V. So I get, I probably had an eight ounce on that day. Yeah, but it's quantities. The serving sizes are like so important to actually calculating the calories properly, and it takes practice. But generally speaking, if you can get yourself a little bit more, I find the greatest success is planning ahead, of course. But um, I don't know. Like, let, let's just chat about this thirty-seven hour fast because I okay. Think... So this is this is your this is your experience with yeah. what is ultimately, and and I'll I'll speak for everyone. That sounds awful. Yeah, yeah. So the 37-hour fast, we can get into the other diet models, but it's kind of interesting because it made me reflect on so much information, so many experiences I've had. And uh, it's kind of funny, the 37-hour fast, what had happened, Mm -hmm. lost six pounds one day. It had to have been fat, right? Just fat? I I mean, Um, I'll tell you, my initial jerk is no. Yeah, Knee so jerk says absolutely I'm not. pretty sure most of it was water. My weight is still lower, but I lost six pounds, an awful lot of bloat. But I would say that it wasn't very difficult for me, and we should dig into that, mm-hmm. because I'm already semi and intermittent faster because I'm a glutton and I like to eat a lot of food. Right. So if I don't eat breakfast and I can push those meals together a little bit at the end of the day, I feel way more satisfied for me. So I've already kind of got into a higher protein, low carbohydrate standard diet. Mm -hmm. So for me to skip my, you know, eight or 10 hour eating window that I generally eat, and I don't really attempt to just specifically intermittent fast, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't that bad. I wasn't getting extreme hunger. I was more, to be honest, I got hungry when I normally get hungry. Right. And if I didn't eat, then I quit being hungry as if I ate. Then, right. So like, yeah, if you, if you normally would eat at noon, you start getting hungry at like 1145, right? You would eat at noon and you'd be not hungry by 1230. Yeah. It was the craziest thing as it went through and I eat kind of frequently in that window. Okay. And to have the hunger go away was interesting because I have always looked at hunger as a growing thing. Once I take a bite for the day, I am eating. And that's just the way my body works. Not everybody's like that. You can have a breakfast early in the morning. And sure, if you don't gain a crazy appetite by the end of the day, you're good to go. But for me, when I start eating, I want to eat. So this was actually even easier, I think, than the intermittent fasting. And my Because you didn't tease it. I didn't tease food. Yeah. the, The tough part is going to be, if anyone ever tries this, the tough part is the family interaction. Mm-hmm. You know, when you sit down at dinner, I normally cook dinner, so I'm, you know, cooking dinner. And when you sit down and you're looking at everybody and they're like, uh, you're not going to eat Where's there? your plate? Right, right, right. That's what I found to be the, the oddest thing was mm-hmm. the interaction socially with not eating. So maybe I might mix this in a time or two um, when you were going to be away, right. or when it, when food wasn't exactly essential, but you might or as busy, well be when alone. You're really busy. You, you want to be alone and busy because yeah. you know if something one is going to set you off. Now I've got two young kids, so mm-hmm. I, I didn't really find the mood thing to be so crazy, which was interesting. Because that's what a lot of people would say. A lot of people would say, "When my blood sugar drops, I get angry." Yeah, that's a, that's what I'm saying. So I, I was kind of surprised at some of the feelings I had. I wasn't really moody, which I thought I would have been. Now, would your wife say the same thing? I think so. Okay. okay, I mean, we're (laughs) we're grinding right now. You know, (laughs) we got a newborn and a four-year-old, so we're grinding anyway. But I don't think that I was very, didn't feel overly moody. Uh, I didn't feel all that different. My biggest takeaway was when you're already eating a super low-carbohydrate diet, you are kind of teeter tottering if you're not aware of minerals and things that you should be trying to get your hydration. Mm. And I started cramping. I hate cramping and I never cramp unless I do some kind of crazy diet test, right? I love experimenting. I think it's fun. And I started cramping in my hamstrings at like so hour. Know, I was going to ask, what hour did this hit? Yeah. So this was right around uh, hour 37. I was like, you know, I'm not going to take this any farther because I don't really want to have a pulled hamstring and do newborn stuff all day. So, so you're saying the could have gone longer. Could've. The cramping was like, I'm going to tap out because this is a negative side effect that I'm actually feeling and there's no reason for me to continue here. Yeah. So maybe a side quick story. I did a a carnivore diet the previous year for 28 days. Yeah. I remember this one. And my issue there was also water. I was not doing probably what was required, adding salt to everything and all those kinds of things. And I was just having cotton mouth so much. And you know, there comes a time when you're doing one of these crazy tests where you're like, 
why am I doing this to myself just right. to learn? It just doesn't. It seems as though you get to a point like you have cotton mouth because it's your fault, dum dum. Right there, <laughs> there is a very quick way to fix this. Don't do what you're doing. Yeah, like why don't you eat some food with some real, you know? And um, I was drinking tons of water and I just could not hold the water. And I'll never forget mm. this. As long as I live, I took one handful of peanuts. And I ate the peanuts, and within probably 30 to 40 minutes, no cotton mouth. So just that blast of salt that said... Whatever it was, I don't really... You know, there's a lot of mixture in peanuts. There's a whole lot of richness to them. A lot of different um, nutrients that... Mm -hmm. I don't know what part of it, because I was eating a lot of salt. So I was Mm. already dumping tons of salt on the meat. So whatever it was about that handful of peanuts, it killed my cotton mouth for literally probably 72 hours. Zero cotton. That's all it took. That's all it took. So new plan, the protein diet with a handful (laughs) of peanuts every 72 hours. Yeah, could be. Could be. But you know, that is market it right now. Like that's a million dollar idea. The the new keto. We'll call it the handful of nuts diet. That's going (laughs) to sell like hotcakes. People are going to love it. Don't forget your nuts. (laughs) (laughs) So let's, let's take this then. You've gone through... 72 hour fast. You've yeah. gone through a um, a protein only diet. Uh, have you have you done just straight calorie restriction before? Oh yeah, yeah. All right, many well, how, times. Did that work? Yeah, it's it's basically all the same thing. the The general consensus with all of them is I've literally and I'm sick and twisted like that. I can stick to anything just to know what works. If you, right. when I was growing up, if you would have told me exactly what it took to throw a baseball five miles an hour harder. I would have done exactly that and never strayed from it. So I've always been in this dire need for like, I need to know Mm -hmm. if this is the right thing. And unfortunately, it all leads back to the same path. Right. Carnivore diet. Have you ever eaten only meat? You have to eat like a pound and a half of steak. If you're 6'4 and weigh 210 pounds and need calories, Mm -hmm. there's no way. Which is super cheap. Right, right, right. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. But I'm just saying, like, when, you, when you're counting your calories, for me to maintain 3,200 calories on an all-meat diet, I was eating more food than I felt like I've probably ever eaten in my life and still losing weight. Mm-hmm. And I'm not exactly saying that, hey, everyone should run out and do the carnivore diet because you're going to lose all this weight. Right. But if you're able to restrict your calories, guess what? You're gonna lose weight. <laughs> well, so so let, let's kind of go down that. You've got the the calorie uh, the calorie count of the carnivore diet is probably similar to like the paleo diet that a lot of people talked about, and that's because it's it's a very similar process in that you're doing mostly proteins, but all of your plants are basic plants, like they are not you know processed at all. And so if you go through any of those calorie apps or anything like that, you can see that you grab a head of broccoli and you have you're holding in your hand like 17 calories right so any of those things are so calorie um the opposite of dense like they are so calorie light that yeah your volume issue and stomach space really becomes your your issue um, which is good because it means that people should feel satiated more because their stomach is constantly full uh, you'll be in a nutritional deficit but a but a volume surplus in many ways. Well, the you know, no matter which diet format you're talking about, most of the time if you're eating super satiating foods that mm-hmm. make you feel full, you can hold a diet restriction for longer periods of time. The problem is is that when you get to the point at which your body really wants to start grabbing fat or I should say doesn't want to grab any more fat, your body fights you. It worked hard to make all that fat. Right. And I've seen this multiple, multiple times through all kinds of different clients, tests within myself, you get to a point at which you are literally a bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. You can go eat, and then once you get to that point at which your body either is going to really start breaking down some more fat or not, most people chalk it up as a cheat meal. I hate the idea of cheat meals. You can do any of those certain things, but don't think those calories don't matter. It just means that you ate in a large enough deficit for, say, 7 to 14 days that you can stand a surplus of an extra 3000 and still get results. It is a, it's not exactly 
I think your body's a little bit slow to do things too. If you're on a roller coaster downhill and you have a hiccup, you're still going to go downhill. Right. If you're gaining weight and eating tons of food and you're on a fat build process and your body is religiously pounding calories to fat cells, you can skip a couple meals and you're still going to keep gaining fat. It's definitely a freight train. If right. you know what I mean. It's, like, it's got a it's got a momentum to it. It's a, yeah, it's 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 not uh, so responsive. I don't believe in my experiences I've ever seen it to be like exact without a any you know variable ness to right. it at all. And it, you know, but at the same time the the tough part is you always have the variable on counting calcula- calories of how accurate did you count? Mhm. And how accurate was your exercise quantities? Because it may be completely exact. If you could literally count them to a T every single meal, you might find that it is exact, exact. Well, so I think we should do a couple things right now. First of all, um, there are studies that exist out there. And there is a difference between how we, you and I, and and most people um, estimate their calorie loss and how a very well done study does. And then secondly, I think we kind of need to talk about some of these uh, terms that we've been using uh, that a lot of people interchange for just food, which is, is not accurate. So first of all, uh, when we calorie restrict, when we are doing all our stuff, we're doing it mostly through an app. We're, we're recording. You could do it without an app, and you could just be very meticulous about reading the back panels of, of um, different foods that you're eating and things like that. You're basically just making a food diary. Um, and you're estimating the amount of that food unless you do have a scale and you're measuring it. You're estimating the amount of food that you're doing, and the whole thing is basically an estimate. When a study is going to do a calorie restriction, and they're they're controlling for this, they are weighing the food, they um, they know exactly the amount that everyone's getting, and they are making sure that those uh, foods are are fully like it's not a label; it is a tested food. What is the uh, study that we were talking about, or we read through earlier? The uh... Uh, Ian Templeman at all? Yeah. 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 So he had a great study that was. He was assessing whether or not calorie restriction, uh, which is just straight, I do three meals a day, we'll say, and I just reduce the amount of calories I take. So we'll say from 2,000 to, you know, 1,800. It was variable because he was controlling for what's your norm, what's your everything like that. I'm not putting everybody on 2,000. I'm putting everybody on a, on a weight sustaining. So he took um, the, the number of people in his study, and he gave them four weeks ahead of time where they were actively measuring intake, they were actively measuring uh, activity levels, and they were controlling for all of these things. And that's perfect. That, that's a very well yeah. done study. Yeah, perfect. Um, so that's different than like you've got a lot of data, but the data didn't control for these things. So exactly. your data can't be a study, but it can be at least information to consider. So this study then, they were taking all that into account and they were trying to decide, does calorie restriction three meal a day calorie restriction, uh, do better, worse, the same as alternate day fasting, which is 24 hours with no food. And then the next day you eat like normal. But well, you, sorry, not like yeah. normal. You're, you're making up for the calories you missed. So that was alternating what day. What a day that would be. I know. That, what a day. 4,000 calories that day. So <laughs> yeah. So you've got, um, you've got, that was your kind of control. This, this group of people, which they were all controlling for each other. Again, really well done uh, study. Uh, that one was, uh, you've got your your standing, I don't intend to lose any weight, I'm just trying to see if fasting actually makes me lose weight even though the same calories are being taken in. And the third group was alternate day with the calorie restriction. So it's the same calorie restriction as your calorie restriction group being that they would be at 75% of their normal. This one would be 150% on their on day, 0% on their off day, which would even out to be about 75% of their normal. And his, his study was really well done and it was really well executed. It was a bit short, only lasted about four weeks, but the data was so tight that you can draw some, some pretty good conclusions out of it. You know, for most people though, too, you got to think if you got to go longer than four weeks to actually truly see a difference in things, no one is going to do any of that. Most so people give up. If you could structure, I, I the would way give that, up. Yeah. If he, if he structured the way that he structured this study and then the amount of time, it would be awesome to see what that data would be over 12 months. But to be quite frank, a four week window, that's about as realistic as it gets. You could mm-hmm. probably convince anybody in the world to say, Hey, we do think it for a month. month. Yeah. One month. What are we going to get? And yep. 
I think it tells an awful lot. I don't know that it needed to be longer. It would have been amazing if it could have been longer. Yeah, or if like a certain number of them decided to stay on, but that would change the randomization because these would be people motivated to continue to stay. Nevertheless, so the things they found, um, they found that when you alternate on your fasting and you do not change your calories, so you're 100% of your calories, but you're doing 200, zero, 200, zero, no change. They didn't, they didn't see a um, significant change in the person's overall um, weight. And so that kind of says just fasting doesn't matter. Like it, for those that are like fasting is it. It puts your body into a whole different system and you burn, you burn your fat. Now we're talking about in, in this format, we are referring to fat loss. Mm -hmm. Not as much all the autophagy aspects and things where... You know, you never really know. You know, if you can start getting so, into these really complicated things, that's... I'll, I'll touch on that for a second, too, because he did... He, oh, this is a good study. So that part, calorie-wise, or sorry, not calorie-wise, fat loss-wise, they didn't lose. So then the next two groups are both calorie-restrictive. The calorie-restrictive lost about the same amount of weight. So they lost the same amount of weight, but then they had actually measured for all of the fat loss versus non-fat loss, because... We've got, you know, lean uh, body tissue as well, which accounts for like organs, water weight, connective tissues, all of the uh, bones, all of the things that you have in your body that aren't fat. And they found that there was a reduction when you're doing fasting versus just calorie restriction. There was a, a higher reduction in those parts and specifically in your like muscle tissue. So the people that did alternate day fasting with a restricted calorie had a reduced a significantly reduced muscle mass at the end of it versus the people that just did calorie restriction of the same amount. Which is interesting because it may just be water. It could, it could be. I'd have to get really tight in there to see exactly what, because they did try and measure for many things. Right. And I'd, have to get, I'd have to go back into the study and see exactly what things were missing. But it was notable that they said that the content of loss was notable between the two. Right. And that the calorie restriction, you were more likely to be able to maintain things like muscle mass, which I know that you went through a lot of stuff during your master's uh, to determine why it is that we retain or lose muscle over time. Sure. So that, I mean, it, this study proves that, yeah, you need to continue to intake proteins to continue to maintain muscle. Well, and kind of build. two different systems altogether, really. Right. But the, the the reason why I suggested the water element is it's kind of an easy way out, right? You don't really know. It's the unexplainable. It's kind of the pieces that, you know, that's what I find to be insane about any of this, these topics is, is anybody tells you that they know for sure anything, they're probably wrong. I because, mean, unless they have sat there and they've stuck you in a, in a room where they put a mask over your to, face. And they, but to say what I mean though, is to say like, I could give you precise advice and it will probably work sure but does it, if anyone is actually telling you exactly specifically which system was which and what was what every single time and every right. single example there's literally no way you can do it you know right when it when i was going through tons and tons of education with all this stuff i'll never forget trying to work through the krebs cycle and all these things learning and then i'm talking to the teacher one day and somehow it came up that this was a theory. I was like so blown away. I thought I was learning facts. I just, I just spent the yeah. last year learning this is exactly how it works. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like a probability of sureness is very high. But to think that you're not actually learning like a specific fact on it was always yeah. a crazy concept to me. But nonetheless, when you take my example of the 37-hour fast, it took me nearly 72 hours to plane my water levels back out. It took a while. Oh, you mean afterwards? Yeah, that's what I mean. It wasn't like, oh, I, I ate some food. I'm back in the game right away. It took a little while for whatever it was. Uh, you know, when you take a, all of your blood glucose and you start doing those and you, and you empty out your liver, and I would imagine that if you go in a certain amount of time that you're taking all your storage tanks of readily available glucose is all gone. Yeah. And in that... Tons of water weight depletes. Yeah. And then when you cycle from day to day, I, I would just, that's my theory with that group is it very well I would be, I would I, guarantee that their lean body mass had an awful lot to do with water just because the window was so tight on the altering that it just, you, you permanently almost lost that extra storage tanks of glycogen mm -hmm. that might've been stuck into something, you know, but it, who knows, but nope. it, it was, that study is an awesome indication or a, a very well done thought out grouping 
that gave results that seem to pretty much run in line with calorie counting does really matter. Mm -hmm. Energy consumption does really matter. There's no magic bullet, unfortunately. Well, I mean, the magic bullet is that that's, that's true. And I think that's important. So, so it's really about what you've got two frameworks. You've got the biochemical framework, which is like calories in calories out is absolutely, it works. It's real. Like we've thrown it through this very rigorous study and it came out true. So, so calorie counting actually matters, but then you've got the other side, which is, it's more important really, which is the psychology of the person that you're trying to develop a diet for. Even if that person is yourself, because what can I stand? Can I stand to lose calories in breakfast and be able to retain them in the other parts of the day? Well, yeah, well then in that case, that's going to go really, really well for you. If you're a person that can't stand that and I need to do a restriction across the whole day, well, then that's going to be the thing that goes really well for you. It's really about how can I personally manage calorie restriction to get the the desired um, effect? Well, and you know, sometimes too, when you think about it in terms of uh, a diet plan, like an Atkins or something, that's an intricate format that explains to you the things that you can eat and you can eat abundance of. When you put shackles on people, no one likes it. It's very tough mentally. And to be honest, if you've been a true calorie counter and you enter everything in. Now, remember, I recorded for three years every single item I've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. And it lines up nearly perfectly if you underestimate your calories. And what I mean by that is... Not quite frankly, not literally underestimate, but I'm not the person that if I put this in that I'm going to say, oh, I ate half. I'm going to make sure that I cleared it. So did I eat a serving and a half? Probably 1.6 servings then. I'm going to make sure that I'm in the numbers so that I can get the results. You were as tight as you could be. Yeah, as tight as you could be underestimating exercise. And the funny thing is, is that study that came out on these fitness watches with the margin of error. If you go off of this, my advice to people all the time was do not turn on your activity app. If you want to track your fitness. Or you're saying in a calorie, if you're tracking through a calorie counter, Mm -hmm. don't activate the activity part of your watch yeah to, to add to that exactly okay. because whatever it was about all of these clients that whenever they started you know you get a little motivated right i, I get you a little weight off you now you understand the system i know what i'm supposed to eat i'm, I'm all in i'm all in oh you got a fitness watch do you well, i need a fitness watch well do you what do you do with it what do you, so that became part of the protocol and when Everyone gets the the watch. It is very fun. And don't get me wrong, motivation is great. But it's very fun to see these insane numbers come out of these watches. I turn it on for my weightlifting. I burn 685 calories in an hour and a half. And I'm like, you're not even sweating. I don't think you did. That's not possible. But when you eat into that, always negates the entire... You're saying when when you believe you've burned 600 calories, and so you then you then add 600 calories to the food intake side. That's the tricky thing okay. about these apps. The apps will give you where you think you should be, whether or not that's right. Remember, you could adjust it. Everyone's different. Yes. So if it says, hey, you're supposed to eat 1850, and you're eating 1850, and you're not really losing any weight, it's probably because you don't burn 1850. Right. So uh, Which you can adjust for. Almost right. every, I don't know of any app that doesn't. You just go in and say, all right, well, then I need to adjust down a couple, of cal- a couple hundred calories. Right, right, right. And and anytime that you bring in a fitness app, more or less that 1850, say you burn, you know, 600 calories or something, you're going to add that to that. And a fitness app would show you that you then could eat into those calories. Yes. And I would agree. I don't think there's anything wrong with eating into those calories. But if you eat the full margin of what they give you, no bueno. The yep. best results that I ever had was if you worked out for like an hour and you wanted to give yourself 100 extra calories, you would probably have no problem doing that. If you got into anything extra, you may or may not be getting the same results. You know, so, the, the so margin not, of error was a real thing. Right. You're not you're not arguing the fact that the calories that you burnt in that workout do not get to be eaten. That part is true. What you're balking at is the idea that that, that estimate is accurate. Yeah, unfortunately, the, I think that's what opens the doors to an awful lot of uh, Dr. Fung, for instance, he is big on talking about these long period fasts and how they're amazing for weight loss and all these different attributes of, of what occurs to your body when you're not consuming food. But to be quite frank, the underlying variable is in my 37 hour fast, I had like the most minimal appetite the next day at all. I tried to eat the same meal 
for instance, and maybe this is just me. Uh, that's so always a possibility. The day after the fast, thirty-seven hour. I drank a protein shake, and I had some popcorn because I was trying to get a lot of salt. I was not going to deal with cramps while I have a newborn. Not going to happen. So I was trying to get a little bit of salty food, and it was still kind of lingering around towards the evening hour. So I get the same meal that me and my family always have gotten. You know, always get the same stuff. So we go to this place where I get fried boneless wings, and I'm thinking. Could you get any more sodium in a food? Well, I, I personally like how you have, have intentionally not advertised for this this uh, oh, establishment yeah. of eating. Like, Oh, no, I, I love them. I love them. <laughs> hey, we are not uh, sponsored. So so this yeah. is – you're welcome. Yeah. This is yeah. cutting edge, no sponsorship. No, Great Wings, love them. But I get the same thing every time, and I was going to curb this, app, this, this salt thing. I had to get salt in my body, so I wanted to order that because that's what I knew. Anyway – Normally how it goes is I'm a glutton unless I truly stick to a plan. Just like probably everybody in the world. That's why everyone's overweight. I eat all of my wings, mm -hmm. and then my wife eats like a bird. I should say, except for her, apparently. So then I eat half of hers, and then I eat most all the fries of my child. Whenever we do this, and, and we don't go out to eat all the time, but when we do, I'm going to eat. Right. And uh, I it got to about eight of them. There's 12. I could not eat another bite. This never happens. I could smash food into my stomach no matter what. At any point in the day, there is more room in my stomach. And this particular occasion, first time it's ever happened in my life, I was not sick. I did not have a stomach bug. There was nothing stopping my appetite. It 100% in 37 hours shrunk my stomach. Hmm. I will repeat. Right. I, I say, will this is This is a one-off. It was one time, you know. Um, but I literally couldn't eat another bite. Yeah, And so I put them away and, and I saved them and didn't eat anybody else's food. I was mind blown sitting on the couch. I was like, this is maybe the first time this has ever happened. And calculus flowing around yeah, trying to I'm decide like, how did, many calories you actually didn't consume. Yeah do, you, versus... yeah, do you mean to tell me that literally I tried to eat an insane amount of food? I was okay with that. Yeah. I, I wasn't in Game it. plan, eat like I'm going to die. Yeah, I was. I was looking for an abundance so that I would retain water like crazy. And I literally couldn't do it. And what's interesting to me is, back to my point on this, the problem with some of these aspects is you, you're literally explaining calorie deficit. If I'm going to fast for 37 hours or whatever the protocol is, and you eat the same amount of weight or eat the same amount of calories as you missed, you will not lose an ounce But there's also something to be said of leaders, and I'm not exactly referring to uh, Dr. Fung is being elite. That's not really my point. My point is Atkins, Jenny Craig, um, Weight Watchers. Calorie count, what, what, they have developed a system that you can follow that if you like to play this game, it will work. Mm -hmm. You don't have to count. Play my game, right? right. Yes, yes. Um, calorie counting apps can become that, – that is a game to play. It's very time-consuming. Most people don't like it. Mm -hmm. If you tell the average person to eat in an eating window from four to eight, nine times out of 10, that person will not consume more calories than someone that could eat from waking up to going to bed. Right. So the one variable behind it all is that most of these formats are trying to give you a different way to calorie restrict and you're just not counting. Right. So imagine that I go 37 hours. I try to break it, trying to get some food in. I, I ate, oh, let me think for a second. I probably ate maybe 2,400 calories. And remember, this isn't a shot in the dark. I and counted my calories for a And decade. what's your number? What's, what's your probably number for burning 3, in a day? Probably 3,000 to 3,200. I probably will sit even Steven. Okay. Um, and you would think it sometimes, you know, you get on these apps and it would tell me that I should be doing more. Um, but that's where I'm at. I, right. I either lose or that's my spot. And so I ate about 2,400 calories is all that I could eat. So what's that equal? So you got 37 20. hours that have zero. Right. And then the, the makeup day, which is supposed to have some more, had less. So you're actually going on probably closer to 48 to 56 hours with reduced calories. And then that hole exists in your entire week's worth of uh, you know, I, calorie intake. I personally don't know. And again, I eat super satiating filling food. I don't know many people that have ever had huge boneless wings before, but it's probably like a pound of meat is what that is. So 
could I have done different if I was eating French fries and a little bit of this and a little bit of this and like some cake and like really pump my calories? Sure. Right. But if you're eating good foods, most all this stuff is, I feel like is prefaced with eating good foods. If you're eating good foods, well, let's say this. I don't know that technically I could have literally on that day. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I could have eaten that many calories. Put that volume in your body. I don't think I could have eaten 6,500 calories or wherever that would have been mm -hmm. to like maintain my mass. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I think I think that is a really um, big caveat that was sort of glossed over, but I think that's an important caveat to really mention because the volume issue has everything to do with calorie content of the food that you're eating. Uh, so we, let's do this. Um, we've been talking about calories a lot, um, but I think it's important to really understand what a calorie is because most people just think, you know, oh, calories are part of the food which it's not, it's in no way a part of the food. And yet in every way it is the food. Um, so we'll talk about calories for just a second. Uh, calories have been known for, for quite a long time, like many, many, many decades. And all a calorie is, is the amount of energy that a substance has. And they measure this by putting in a, putting a, a food, we'll say a Cheeto, you put a Cheeto in a bomb calorimeter, and then you heat it up and it, it releases the energy. They measure the, the released energy and they tell you exactly how many calories, which is, it's a measure, it's a unit of measurement. How much energy did that Cheeto release? And that, and that's the calorie content. So it's not a building block in that you can't pull a calorie out of a thing. It's not anything like that. It is a unit of, of measurement for energy potential in a substance. And that's really, really important to distinguish because when people talk about calories in, calories out, when people talk about, uh, I, I'm wearing my meals on me, I can fast forever because I, I have, you know, 20 pounds of fat on me. So I have 20 pounds of meals on me. All of that is true and not true because what you actually have is 20 pounds of fat, which has a certain calorie density. And that calorie density is released when that fat is broken down. So the reason I wanted to kind of get to that is, um, you had a, a caveat in there that says, I'm already eating this kind of, you know, I'm already eating a pretty healthy way. And what that means is you're eating foods that are uh, lower in calorie density. And lower calorie density meals means that you have a higher volume of intake with like not the same bang for your buck. Like if you're caveman Trevor, you're starving. Like you've done it, you've done it wrong. Caveman Trevor really wanted all of the cakes, all of the sweets, all of the carbs, all of those things, because they're, Yum. they're cheap. They're, they're, they're lightweight. They are uh, calorie dense, super calorie dense. And they're immediate. Like I just, I have them. Could you imagine a caveman getting to eat like a cake? You think they're, they'd pass out instantly? Here's a ho-ho. Enjoy. You know what I mean though? You think they would pass out instantly if you never had sugar and you were not used to any of it and you just smashed a Costco cake? Yeah. Like Shout I out imagine, Costco. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine, I imagine that, uh, that, that Neanderthal gets handed his little, his little Debbie. He eats it, and for the rest of his life, since he only ever got one, he will be, like, chasing that high. Yeah. Like, he never will have another little Debbie again. Could you imagine, though, this the explosion of flavor mm -hmm. if all you've eaten is bloody, raw, maybe cooked meat? Mm -hmm. Costco. Yeah, no cake. kidding. But on top of that, like, you, you've you now eaten what probably amounted to, like, two days' worth of food in the same volume. Yeah. And so, like, uh, you've got the numbers, if I remember right, but... Um, your protein, your carbohydrates, as far as macros go, they have, what is it, like five? Um, is it oh. four? Four. So you got four calories per gram mm -hmm. of, of those foods, which is it means that they're essentially calorie restriction-wise the same. Um, they I'll break down. Seven. Yeah, they break fat down differently. Nine, yeah. Now, fat nine is the big one because that's what we carry. And so maybe we go into a little bit of that, and you've got a little bit more background on it, but um, how how can I, as a human, carry protein that I can digest? Can I carry protein I ate today to tomorrow? You know, that that's the thing that's kind of interesting is the protein system is very separate, you know, and I've never been this monster bodybuilder to probably give much, you know, reason or belief in what I have to say with anything with protein intake and protein synthesis. But when you're eating and you have to have enough protein to build muscle, but in a sense, but why, it has why, nothing to do do with to your fat that? loss. Why What's do I have that? to eat the protein to build muscle? Don't I, can I can I make protein? Can I 
you know. Oh, no, you have to eat it. Is that what you're meaning? Yeah. Like, you have to consume protein to build muscle. Absolutely. Okay, so there's no other way to do I can't carry yeah, you protein can't, from you yesterday. Can't, I see what you mean. So you, you can't digest fat to make the protein you need. Right. You can't. Uh, it's a fully different functioning system in a sense. Of course, it's one system. It's inside your body. Yeah, it's digestive but, tract is, is But like lean body thing. mass, if you want to maintain lean body mass, the protein consumption has to continue. Because you're not, it, there's no storage tank outside the liver, outside of muscle, outside of blood. There's no storage tanks. Right. All this stuff that's hung, hanging on your body, that's all fat, and that is only fat. It that's, is that is the storage tank. Your energy moving abilities. Right. If you don't get to eat, yeah, of course you're going to start burning fat. Your body's going to turn on the systems, and I would venture to say that that's yet another variable. Is hormones? Mm -hmm. Is you may not be burning if someone is really overweight and they are not good at burning fat or may just have never done it before. I've worked with tons of 50-year-olds that have never even attempted to lose a pound before, and they have finally had enough. And it sometimes takes up to four to six weeks for their body to actually give them fat. Mm. Now, what I've found, first we go through the phase of, God, you're really bad at counting these calories. Yeah, just no awareness. Yeah, then, then we go through the phase of, okay, now we're consistently counting them. Gosh, you're really bad at serving sizes. Be not not that they're doing serving sizes. I'm actually referring to a recording process. Like the idea that you educate someone to understand what a serving really looks like right. and to know what it truly is and how many extra servings they're really eating is kind of baffling for a person to like reflect on. Oh, you mean to tell me then when I coach nutrition's I, I I'm a little bit of a negative Nancy because I'm a glutton. So my version of an explanation is get used to eating next to nothing. Because if you're a glutton, it feels like right. nothing. Well, it's a, it's a huge exaggeration, but it's going to be what it feels like. Yeah. That's what your body will be telling you. But if, if you can get your brain clicking mm -hmm. like, oh, you mean I'm getting to eat nothing. And when you're eating nothing, you get results because you don't really eat nothing. You always cheat. <laughs> <laughs> right. You always cheat. So if you're eating four, oh, you eat six. But if I'm able to eat a steak, I eat 12. Right. If I go to the the store or I go to a restaurant and I'm eating a steak dinner, I'm supposed to have a four ounce steak. So you order the six. Right. You didn't order the 12 house or 12 porter, you know, 12 ounce porter house steak mm -hmm. with all the sides. When you get in the mindset of like, oh, I'm, I'm supposed to be eating nothing, mm -hmm. it gets you in a little bit better window of true serving size. Now, that's like a brainwash mentality. That's what I mean of like the the upper level thought process of who's guiding the deal. What, what can you consistently stay to becomes more and more of a reason to find one of them, experiment with one of them. You mean but, diets? Yeah. Find one of the diets. But really, it's all the same game. Don't get it twisted. It's the same game. Intermittent fasting, whether or not you want to believe that, maybe it will be proven one day, without a doubt, that having smaller eating windows has a massive change on the way that you digest old proteins. And maybe it does have amazing uh, impacts towards cancer types of things. Or it insulin, might. the it insulin uh, depletion for your bloodstream that happens, which is one of the major touts of, of doing any kind of fasting, is actually yeah. very beneficial. The, that science is not proven proven yet, but right. those, are the, those are the claims. Right, and, and I don't know that one day we might find those to be major, major impacts. But if you're listening to something or trying to get educated and motivated to do a certain thing, do not get it twisted. No one is wrong. They're all playing the same game. Right. And that's one thing that I think is a little insane. How everyone gets on a hill and wants to shoot at each other about how they're doing things wrong when they're all playing the same game. You're right. playing a calorie deficit and it's in different formats that most people, if you cut carbs, that is 85% of their diet until they start adjusting things when they realize no carbs means I don't get to eat anything. Well, and 85% <laughs> of their high density diet too. So every, every carb they eat is, is not a carb. It's a carb. Right. And well, that's not filling enough. So I have to have this much, which is way more, more calories. Right. Right. I want to take a second right here. Cause I think this is important too. We are talking about the diet and calorie restriction and things like that with regards to weight loss exclusively. 
we're not talking about you know things like um, protein and, and muscle development we're not talking about things like um, trying to make sure that you have you know certain gut health we're not talking about any diets having to do with anything outside of just weight loss right unfortunately that's one of the pieces of all of this that i think get the waters a little muddy you know the people that are experts at body fat composition it's people that get ready for a show. Yeah, now, these are bodybuilders. Yeah, bodybuilders that get ready for a show and that are also, and I'm not hating on whether you're clean or not, but I really, really, really like to see what happens with the clean bodybuilders only because that's you're not getting any synthetic help in the hormone world. Yeah. I don't have any problem with it, but... But you're if not going you to maintain... tell somebody to go take testosterone to start losing weight. So why would you listen to a person that's taking testosterone that shows that they can lose weight for a bodybuilding competition? But don't get me wrong. I don't. I think that people that get ready for a show and get to the results, I do not doubt that all of them know exactly what they're doing and without a doubt. But my point behind this was not to hate on any, mm -mm. any given talent or endeavor. It's more of... If you were to track everything these guys are doing, they are playing a calorie game. Yes. And it works every single time. My other point to refer to bodybuilders is, is those people train for a reason and get a result. And uh, most of the time it's all stacked around muscle. So, Well, and, and fat percentage. But, but my point is, is that's where people maybe don't want to listen or think that, oh, that's bodybuilder talk. That's you, you're referring to these systems and all this complicated stuff because you're trying to be a bodybuilder and build the most optimal amount of muscle. Right. And I think that the detachment between like true muscle gain and body fat, you should be listening to these people. You they're, should be. They're, they're the they're freaks doing, on the frontier yeah, of what someone can do. Yeah, whether or not you want to build the muscle, again, that's that has to do with training volume. It has to do with dedication in the weight room. It has to deal with um, how much protein, how well your body is genetically at building muscle. Um, protein synthesis, are you great at optimizing that? Do you have optimal hormone levels? Do you get enough sleep? Do you get consistent ingestion of those types of proteins all the time? If you're doing those things, you'll get to build muscle. But it doesn't mean that the system of losing fat is not the system to lose fat. And for right. the average Joe, I mean, that's who I tend to talk to most because I don't feel as though I'm in a bodybuilder category, but I'm in a very optimal fat range. And I play the same games as a upper level bodybuilder would play to lose fat. I understand the system. I get the system and I try to get people that are, you know, obese or a little overweight to understand that the game is not a bodybuilder game. That game is the fat loss game. Well, it's that simple. So it's the fat loss game. I think bodybuilders is a really good example, but it's probably maybe a, an untouchable or an unknown example for, for most people. But we have one that, especially thanks to Marvel, that exists all the time right now. <laughs> like you talk about the, you know, all the Chris's that decided to lose all that body fat percentage so they look great on screen. You talk about, you know, all these females that are that are trying to trim out to make sure they look like, like they're trying to look like characters that were drawn. It's it's an absurd uh, change, but it's recognizable because we all see them. So when you see, you know, Chris Hemsworth with like a very narrow band of body fat around his body, you get to see in in like HD exactly what that looks like on a person. But when you actually go through and see what things they're doing, it is exactly the same thing as what bodybuilders are doing. Sure, massive calorie restriction and to a very specific type of calorie because you don't want bloating. And to a very specific hydration uh, quota because you don't want bloating. You don't want to retain any of that for that ever, one shot. Did you ever hear the interview from Hugh Jackman when he was talking about the one scene he had in one of the later films? No, uh, tell me. Well, you know, he got extra shredded in his 50s, which... Everyone hey, does. Hey, hey, Everyone not, does that. I'm not saying or insinuate. I'm just, you know, he got really jacked and shredded as an older male is hard very very not easy and um but it was funny he was talking about his water cut coming up to that scene and it was literally all the things that he was doing to are we get talking ready. the wolverine scene where he bursts out of the water and he looks like he's literally chiseled out of marble i think so. in it's his his movie right the oh no, no, no. wolverine well, movie i think 
It uh, could have been. So there, there's a scene in that, and there's a scene. I think it was in X two where he comes out of the water and just no you know, X two wasn't out. his biggest time. He, he, he wasn't got as big as, big as he was on. lean, but it wasn't his biggest. You're right. But, but yeah, so it, you know when you're looking at these characters and you're seeing, I mean, you did a water cut for how many days to shoot right. a six second shot with your shirt off? Yeah, just right, ah. right. But you know, do you have to go to those extremes? The bodybuilder's last leg of a cut before a show is brutal, awful. I mean, I've, I've never heard any of them I've say it was a good it. time. It's, it's not a good time, and uh, but it's it's funny though because the game leading up to it is the game of life. And they're trying to retain as much muscle as possible when they come up to a show. But everybody should be trying to uh, retain as much muscle as possible. Um, that's one thing that I just find interesting. I think this entire topic, it's I'm hoping that we'll get the insight. We'll get the skinny one day. We'll oh, know. you mean like science advances enough that this we all have access to this knowledge? Yeah, we'll just know like for a fact, does the fasting in a longer period of time. Cause really that's the only difference. It, the, the latest craze with the fasting aspects is all of the other things that could do for you. Could it prevent cancer? Could it, um, get rid of all these muscle proteins that could lead to Alzheimer's? I mean, there's a lot of those right. things that are also being packaged. Other can it health cure benefits. diabetes. Can it, you know, all those things. I don't know that there's any like exact perfect science on any of it right now, but don't get it twisted for fat loss. It's the same game. I think that one study is probably one of the best studies that has been done. Mm -hmm. and um, Because I think it was they did, so well tracked. They did you, such a good job. Have you used fitness trackers much? I have. So the, the one, like I said, the one that I've used the most is, uh, it's not the MyFitnessPal, it's Lose It. Lose it. And, and no, but are you talking about, you're talking about for counting calories. Mm -hmm. Have you used a fitness tracker for your exercise? Okay, yeah. So the, I've got the watch that, regularly does that and i can tell it you know i'm doing this kind of uh, exercise i'm doing this kind of exercise and i've gone through quite a range of the exercises and it does give a variable um you know rate of calorie use or calorie expenditure is what it's guessing um and it is tied to my heart rate and it does do all those things and i actually had it paired in for a while with the calorie tracker and i was finding that i would eat into those calories every day and it would keep me it would slow me down. Um, I've slow found, your results down. Slow my results down. Yep. So um, I I assumed that the reason for that was it was estimating I was burning more calories than I actually was, uh, and that and I think the reason for that because I didn't notice it until weeks into it. I think I became more efficient at working out, which is like there's plenty of literature that shows that your body is built for efficiency, and the longer you do something, the better your body gets at it, and so I think that's what was happening with me. I would do this type of exercise. I would get my heart rate up and I'd get cranking along. And uh, my heart rate, you know, my my tracker would say, all right, you've, you've burned 400 calories today in this workout. Like, great, awesome. And I'd eat into those 400 calories. And, and I would still lose weight. But then by like week three and week four when I'm doing that, I'm doing similar kinds of, they were calisthenic, uh, hit style exercises. I found that I had to go harder to get my heart rate up as high as it was before. Uh, and I, I ended up having to go longer. And so if I continued to, to make my exercises longer and harder, I could still kind of get the same results, but, but it was tapering. Isn't that crazy? How yeah. It's like, it, it, it's in my mind, it's almost like it's a positive. Your body gets super efficient. That's what you're supposed to do. So that's, that's what you have to tell yourself when you realize the game gets harder. Oh, it's it's you're just this more, is good. You're just more efficient. Right. So so that said, I found that I had to just start ignoring the calories that I was getting from my exercise because I was getting too efficient at my exercise. I could after a while get up there and do the same workout I did, you know, week one, and I while my heart rate would go up, I wasn't breathing any harder and I wasn't sweating anymore, which I thought was really weird. Like, and I'm sure there's going to be plenty of people that look at it and go, that's not possible. Oh, it, but it is. It was. Well, my it's progressive overload. Up. I mean, right. it's a simple, simple concept that you, at first it was difficult. Body adapts. Now it's All of a sudden it's not a, uh, as difficult. And I always think it's crazy to see when people don't sweat. I get that everyone has different sweat glands, but that is not me. No. Uh, when I'm and and out, I normally I'm sweat like crazy. Yeah. But it goes to show you, though, if you're not taxing your system the same way as you were before, mm -hmm. that's generally what you're getting out of that. You know, it's 
I, I find it interesting, too, that it, it almost feels a little bit more when I talked earlier about the concepts at which what game are you going to play? Mm -hmm. One of the one principles that I like to think of is it feels a little bit more like it's a reflection. You're a reflection of what you eat rather than you are what you eat. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So unpack it. So what I mean is, so if you start eating 2000 calories and say that's a deficit of 500, you lose a pound every single week, but then all of a sudden, so Maybe I should spend that. So a pound of body fat is generally 3,500 calories of a deficit cut out of your diet, right? And pretty seven simple. times 500 is 3,500. Yeah, pretty simple concept. You've probably heard it all over the internet. But the application of these processes always seem to change, which is why people get led into standing on a hill of keto, standing on a hill of all these different processes, because there is that variable element of your body adapting to your exercise and adapting to your calorie intake. You know, imagine if you were 50 pounds heavier positive and moving and negative. around. That's the crazy part. It, it, it adjusts positive and negative. Yeah. It goes both ways. Yeah. And the, how much you were just moving right there, right? How much you were moving that burns calories, everything you're doing. If you weighed 50 pounds more, that would take more calories to move all those joints mm -hmm. every single minute of every single day. So the idea, my concept is your reflection of what you eat in my mind gets you a little ready for what's to come. Because once you start getting your wheels turning of 2,000 calories is what I'm going to eat now, well, if you truly stick to it long enough to lose the body fat and you truly kind of stay on that path, guess what? You don't get to eat 2,500 again. Right. You just get to your eat number's 2,000. 20, yeah, your number's 20. Or, or it might be 2,100. But that's the thing that is uh, the reason why everybody gains it back you can put a million different reasons. You can get really scientific on it. But you got to remember that if you start eating what the diet was before, yeah. your body literally burns less calories. Now, you can say it's your basal metabolic rate went down or any of those factors. But to be quite frank to me, it makes perfect sense. It takes less energy for you to move a littler body. True. Your body becomes more efficient at moving fat in and out. You just lost a bunch of weight. Mm -hmm. Your body utilizes its muscles more efficiently if you're exercising. Everything gets more efficient. Yeah, you're high-tuning yourself. Right. So if you're giving your body a tune-up and you s go through some kind of a weight loss journey, right? Say I want to stick to something for eight weeks, and I've tested this a million times, and I would say that eight weeks is probably as long as you want to go before you take a bit of a break mentally mm -hmm. or no one will stick to it, but that's beside the point. When it gets to that point, you're, you are a reflection of what you eat, and if you can think about that, as you move through these eight weeks, you'll slowly start to see that sooner or later that calorie deficit, as long as it's a conservative one and you're roughly around the 500 mark, mm -hmm. generally what all these apps tell you to do, you're going to find that you're probably going to be eating that way forever. Right. So that's, that's, your new, that's your new number. Right, and where I've come of doing this for 20 years is basically you start going, I have to eat healthier foods to eat this amount of food and still thrive and be happy and thrive. I mean, if thrive isn't the word that should be thrown around more often, I don't know what is. Do you want to live life or do you want to thrive? Right. Um, the 37 hour fast, for example, if you could tell me that maybe all variables aside, I don't have awkward moments with my family judging me. Sure. <laughs> I, I, uh, come more prepared with, Drinking all the, you know, get some Pedialyte in your life. Get get some things that can retain some water beforehand. If I could roll a 37-hour fast, 36, I, I don't really care what the hour is, into that range, and you mean to tell me that I could eat 3,200 calories the rest of the week, I would be interested in that. Mm -hmm. I like to eat food. Right. So I could eat more food throughout the week because I packed my deficit into one day. Haven't tested it. Couldn't tell you. I've only done one. I'm willing to do more. I'm not willing to do more if hydration is a weekly issue. Oh, you're saying um, like if if what you experienced as a byproduct of a 37 hour fast is the that's just the experience. Yeah, back out. Yeah, I have no interest in dealing with water. I realize there's a lot of things that I could do to prevent that. Mm -hmm. And if I went into it doing that, getting my hydration at a really optimal level before it. Maybe I don't have any of those issues. And if I could do that, I might be interested in that. But but that kind of, that kind of is the point tool, of what you're tool saying. It's a tool bag. Yeah, it, it's really the point of what you've been saying throughout this entire conversation, which is um, 
every, every different tool will hit a different body in a different way. And if this one doesn't work for you, um, let's do calorie restriction through a different way. And it, it doesn't necessarily have to be that your body doesn't burn it the same because that may or may not be true. Don't know. Don't know how your yeah. body's burning whatever it's burning because that's the stuff that you can't witness it occurring. You can just witness the results of it occurring. Right. So then aside from that, it's, well, can you mentally stick with it? And maybe physiologically, your body will dehydrate and you'll always get cramps at 37 hours. Well, yucko, don't ever do that. Do a different way. Yeah. Mentally, no. you're okay with doing it. Right. Except for that byproduct. Right. All right, well, let's do 24-hour fast instead because you can do the fast and that's not a problem. 24-hour fast gives you plenty of calories, uh, deficit for the week, and then you get to eat a little bit more throughout the rest of time and you don't run into the problem that you had with water. But you are a person, which I think is really important to note, you're a person who is willing to try. And so I want to know, did a 24-hour work better? Did a 37-hour work better? Like you... I imagine we could have this conversation a year from now and you'll have tried three or four different fasts with actual information on not only what did you eat, what did you drink, but also how did you feel, um, did you like it, how did, the, how did the family deal with it. And those are all important factors when you're trying to build a weight loss diet like that works well, for you. Well, discipline is insanely important, I feel like. For people to be able to be in control of your brain and in control of your habits, I think is insanely powerful. And if anything else, a fast or calorie restriction, anything you've ever tried to do, let's be honest, eating too much food is because of habits. Mm -hmm. Eating too much food is because you do not utilize any discipline in your diet. You say yes when you're hungry and you say yes to whatever you want to eat. So unfortunately, without discipline, you will always struggle with your weight. Well, so I... <laughs> Yes. First of all, very much yes. Um, there is there is some psychology that helps you cheat that though, which I really really appreciate. And uh, the way that works is is you currently your habits are what's stymieing you. I I'm trying to lose weight, and I've got a habit that when I wake up, I eat a bowl of cocoa puffs, and I do this kind of thing. And I'm trying to lose weight, and uh, on my way to work, I always get a, a soda. Uh, or a monster energy drink to kick off my day, or I get, you know, whatever, a donut, whatever thing I do, that's my habit to do, they can be very negative for my weight loss desire. But you can also offload your discipline into habits. Now, to create the habit takes a lot of discipline. You know, you're, you're front loading the discipline side. But once the habit exists, the discipline is now negligible, because you're just, you're habitualized to it. So now in the morning, when I wake up, I don't eat a breakfast. Well, for the first while, that really stunk. And hormonally, I had this ghrelin that was telling me, you got to eat, you got to eat. But now the hormones have dropped. And now my habit is no longer breakfast. My habit is not breakfast. Well, now there's no discipline on that part. And now I've kind of like autopiloted a section of my weight loss plan right out of the gate. And that takes, you know, revisiting it every once in a while to maintain the discipline. But when you can create good habits in your life, uh, from eating and exercise perspectives, it makes it so much easier to maintain or start a weight loss program. But it, it's front loading your willpower. You got to really front load your well, willpower. That's it's exactly right. And the only way that you are successful is by building the habits. That's why most diets do work for a short amount of time, but it's not adequate for your lifestyle. Yeah, you it, hadn't built a habit. You, you just were doing an experiment. Yeah, if 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 you have um, a cupboard full of pasta and you go keto, and you're going to want to eat pasta And the again. pasta you, never went anywhere. Yeah, it's you, still in your cupboard. You might as well just quit doing keto because you are not going to live this forever. And unfortunately, I think like in bold print, if you were to have a, a section in this video that you were like, what are these guys even talking about? The calorie restriction is the thing that got you the weight loss being keto. And if you understand that, you get the bolts of it, the nuts and bolts. And I think if you walked away from any diet plan, really understanding why it gave you results, then you would make sure that you wouldn't make the mistake and you'd still be in the game. And what I mean by that, let me explain. If you're all in on keto and I get there's probably, shoot, there's keto everything now. There's probably some keto pasta out there that exists. I hope so. I'm sure there's all kinds of formats. Just of it. noodles of ground beef. But let's go with a carnivore diet example because this one's pretty simple. You can't make this up. You're either eating meat or you're not eating meat. 
So if you're not actually fully going to embrace this forever and you're using it as a diet, which I highly recommend people utilize extreme diet methods in short windows because it does build insane discipline and freedom from food. When you realize for the first time that you don't have to eat in a whole day, guess what? If you miss Brexit, it, it's not very difficult. Yeah. If you miss dinner, you won't die. Right. But would and, you know that if you I don't I, get super angry like everyone thinks? It, like Snickers has got me sold that I'm going to turn into Betty White if I don't eat a Snickers. <laughs> Rest in peace, Betty White. <laughs> no, but that's a good commercial campaign. It was pretty clever. But uh, no, but think about that. If you're on the carnivore diet and you realize that it's not just that you're eating meat of why you're losing weight, then when you make a mistake, the world has not come to an end. Right. You haven't you, broken your system. You've not broken the whole ordeal. Oh, my goodness. I've come out of ketosis. I've right. done. If you realized and it was understood that your calorie deficit was the reason why you were losing fat, then you would not ultimately say, I'm out of ketosis. It's going to take me three days to get back into it. It's not and worth now it. I'm, I'm over it. I'm right. not going to go through that again. And if I get the carnivore flu for another six days because I went on a cruise and I feel like crap now, there is no way I'm going back through that because that is a real thing for a lot of people. Sure. If, you, if you're a super, super high carbohydrate individual and you move into a carnivore diet, you're going to have a rough six days. That's a heavy pendulum swing. You're going to have a rough, rough six days. But again, that person, if you went out on a cruise and you enjoyed yourself and did whatever, if you realize that all it is, is maybe I'll just exercise for 30 minutes in the morning to keep that number up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't want to exercise because you're already working out. That's fine. Don't exercise. But maybe you realize that if I didn't eat seven donuts and really I'm still just playing a caloric intake game, right? maybe I'll just have one and it's not that big of a deal. I won't gain too much weight because really it's not the ketones and the all the intricate pieces of that diet is not the fat loss. No. The calorie restriction is the fat loss. Right. Now, they're claiming all kinds of other things with doing the ketones and, and, and that part you know, I can't argue, and, and I and I don't know that we really have a good place to argue from there. I don't know that there's ever been tremendously great evidence, and quite frankly, I think this is one of the greatest examples that I heard just the other week from, uh, I wish I could say this guy's name right, Peter Anita Atia. I'm sorry if I butchered it. I love your stuff. Uh, love listening to you talk and all the testing that you do. Uh, Very Atia. awesome. Atia. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the guy's... He tests everything. It's awesome to hear his perspective on what he's done and when he works with his patients and all that stuff. Uh, Peter Atia, mm -hmm. great info. But what he had, um, he mentioned this rat study. And unfortunately, what most people refer to as fact, most of these things are based on rat studies. Yeah. And I find that to be insane to me that everyone is jumps on board of a new fad based on a rat study. Well, we're, we're, very, we're very guarded about starving people because we it's i mean it's a war crime Completely it's all kinds of things like that yeah. so you don't don't put them through these terrible diets because you're like that's how dare you right but a rat go ahead and starve a rat no one cares about a rat but you know it, that's a good point but it's it's hard to actually extrapolate any kind of data out of the short windows of human I mean, just as the study we talked about earlier we liked the way it was set up it seemed as though it answered an awful lot of variables it took a lot of things into considerations its test groups were really well thought out and you got a real good picture of what a four week window did wouldn't everybody in the fitness community slash weight loss slash bodybuilding slash general joe wouldn't you have wanted to know what that would have been after six months i do mm -hmm. i think anybody would say that they would love to can someone please measure every one of these people's food stick them on a machine every day and pay them a hundred grand or something crazy to make them sit in the tunnel and follow exactly what you did so we could have the answer yep. but that ain't real life no and, well, the realization and, and can I extrapolate what you did by forcing a person to eat exactly what they did to what I do every day? Well, no. They had exactly. all kinds of incentives to keep up with Crazy it. variables, social interactions. I mean, yep. there's just an awful lot of variables always. But needless to say, the amount of information that comes out of fat and mice studies is kind of crazy to be always so giving them so much credibility. You're, you're referencing a, a rat study. Yes. Tell what are the results? Yeah, so it was really funny. The study that I, I read, uh, I went and looked at it because I thought it was kind of clever. And I'll probably butcher it because it was about three weeks ago and up and down with all kinds of stuff. But 
Um, more or less, what he found was he was referring to this study that had been quoted a lot by uh, many of these fasting doctors, really talking about how beneficial all these things were and these things that were occurring in your body. Super scientific, specific, intricate stuff that most people don't even care. I just want to lose some weight. Right. Well, it, it hinged, too, on the hours. Right. So in a nutshell, you've got rats they studied. They fed these rats. One of them could eat 24 hours a day or like as much as they wanted. They were gluttons. They could eat, eat, eat. It was always available, and they did. The other group was set up to only eat in an eight-hour window, I believe. Wasn't it a 16-hour study? Yeah, it was a 16-hour window. If of... I'm messing the hours, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm shooting off the top of the head here because I thought it was such a great example. But what they found was that— But you got to mention, during that eight hours that they could eat, full glutton. They yeah. eat whatever they wanted during those eight hours. Yep, and then they were shut down. And what they found was this was a big push for intermittent fasting. What do you know? This eight-hour window for this rat was so amazing. They actually lost body fat and maintained lean body mass. And these other ones, of course, gained all this weight. And you're thinking, huh, we have the answer. The golden nugget. All we have to do this is, is it. not so eat. Here we go. Now we've backed all this. Now we've got a study that shows that intermittent fasting is the end-all, be-all. But wait. Rats die after 48 hours of not eating? Well, so do humans. Wait, what? They can only last 48 hours? And I'm probably saying the wrong number, so that'll be all over the memes. It's probably like 52 or it's probably 60. Or... Right. The yeah. idea is we're talking no, no, no. days before a yeah, rat pro dies. Proportionately extremely different amounts of time. Whether it was 48 hours right. or 65 hours, a human can last, what, 30 days? Yeah, depending like on their fat, month or maybe more. even more if they... Uh, maintain their water levels and stay hydrated enough. Uh, it's just kind of, this is apples and oranges. I mean, this yeah. isn't even the same comparison. You're talking about death if you don't eat in one more day. Right. Or a human that doesn't have to eat for endless amounts of days, depending on your body fat and your hydration levels, and you're just touting that it works. And it was kind of funny, the, the previous study that we talked about, once again, kind of negates the whole idea of that because – I can also tell you from anyone I've ever worked with and or myself, I have played with intermittent fasting a ton because I'm a glutton and I love to really eat large amounts of food. You get a free new 600 calories to add into any meal you want. Right. So you don't eat breakfast. I get to eat you know, two or three, 400 extra calories in the, the two or three meals that I may be having in that window. Works like a dream, but it's a tool, right? But when you think of that intermittent fasting thing, I have gained weight intermittent fasting. I should say, not muscle. I wish. <laughs> I have gained fat intermittent fasting. I have prevented complete weight loss because I, too, like everyone, want the magic bullet. I so badly want this to be an easy, easy format. And what I continually find is if you don't eat and then you eat a whole lot of food, you still ate a whole lot of food. Right. And I, and I think some of that has to do with, you know, if the rat's time frame is in is in hours and days and our time frame is weeks and months, I think the important thing to recognize then is our calorie counting can't be restricted to days. It has to be restricted to weeks and months. You make a really good point because um, one thing that I ran into when I was doing these boot camps um, – over and over again, the idea of the cheat meal. You know, most people love what bodybuilders have to say when it's something to do with eating a, an abundance of food. Most people do not have the exercise output to smash a 500 or 5,000 calorie cheat day. Right. Um, most women in their 50s that are 5'5 five, five or less would be shocked to know that they don't lose any weight because you have to eat like an absolute bird. Right. You don't burn many calories. It's unfortunate. I've worked with a million of them. It's very, very difficult for a short, older woman to lose weight because normally they're very sedentary and their caloric burn is not very great. Right. Nonetheless, the cheat meal, a cheat meal can be utilized in the same version of fasting, but opposite. Mm -hmm. Yes. So if you fast for an entire day and take my numbers, for example, I have a 3,200 calorie deficit coming out of that 37 hour window it's more of a seven to 10 day thing than it definitely is a single day thing. Right. I have tested many different versions of can you make up the calories? And for most people, a cheat meal on a Sunday, yes, it did in fact ruin your weight loss. Yes. Because 
most people's definition is that concept I referred to earlier of a reflection. They are not understanding that that intake is literally what they have to eat to be that size. Mm -hmm. So when you get a chance for a cheat meal, you eat like overeating like you used to on your old caloric intake. So take your numbers. If I canceled out 3,200 calories on a Monday... And, that, and then well, I ate 4,000 on Sunday, I, say, to be I clear, will kill the whole thing. You don't have to do even that extreme because in reality, if you're eating in a, you know, the calorie deficit that most of the weight loss apps tell you to do is like 500 calories a day. Sure. So I don't even know that they let you do more than uh, 1,000, right? Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, they're two mo- pounds a week is the max. That's the way, like if you drag up the scale, it's like two pounds is the max, and, uh, which is a healthy weight loss. Like you don't really want to be doing more than that without like some pretty serious doctor intervention just to make sure that you're not, you know, undercutting some essential nutrients that your body needs to maintain things like, I don't know, brain function. So all that aside. You're trying to lose weight. You're doing it through the calorie app. The calorie app says 500 calories. Uh, it reduced from where your your standing non increase is, and that's the that's the weird catch. Whenever you're doing your your weight loss app, what you really should be doing, and what what I did for like two years when I was doing it was just record for like a month or two doing nothing else. So I'm recording what I'm eating getting good at really just getting good at recording what I'm eating and uh, recording what I'm doing as far as like work and weight loss and stuff. It's unbelievable advice. Unfortunately, it's a lot of work, but that is definitely what people should do. So as I was doing that, I found that um, the 2,500 calories for me was sustaining. So when I'd measure, you know, I'd, I'd do my weight right when I woke up every single day, every single day. And I found that I would teeter around at the same number at that, you know, at that calorie intake and the activity level I was doing. So I knew that was my, my zero. Now I did that the next year and found out that I was actually eating more. And so my number was worse. So I realized that I was, I was gaining weight during that number. So my normal numbers will say 2,500. I was actually eating 2,700, didn't know it and was gaining weight and didn't know it. So when I got to my zero, I had to not only go to my zero and cut 500 off of my zero, that put me not just at, at minus 500. I was actually at minus 700 from what I was at, what I was eating the day before. So that became a really, really big deal because now the cheat meal, if a cheat meal is, is, a, is a good cheat meal, which I've eaten plenty of, I can take a cheat meal. It takes and practice. Take, oh, a lot no. of concentration. Effort. You got you to gotta have focus, drive. There's a song about it. I think... Uh, don't think stop the rock, get enough. Is that no, what it I is? think the rock sings it. It's, oh. it's about drive. It's about, anyway. Nevertheless, he's talking about cheat meals. Um, I would get into this his cheat meal. Delicious. <laughs> God, if I could sit at his table during his cheat meal, I guarantee you, I could go calorie for calorie with that guy. He yeah. eats massive meals on Sunday, but I don't know that everybody understands that. I'm sorry, but the guy probably is on the sauce, so that helps. Um, and what does it help with it? It helps you not main, it, it, you won't gain fat as easily. You've got a different hormonal balance that makes it less likely to gain fat, but he probably also is in a slight deficit. If he's not truly gaining weight after his cheat meals, then he's probably slightly in a deficit throughout right. the week and he balances and that, and out that's, with that. That's kind of what I'm getting at. So if I throw a cheat meal at it and, uh, my cheat meal puts me over uh, a thousand calories, which isn't hard. You know, you eat a good pizza with, um, you know, you have a pizza and a beer and uh, we'll say you had a side because you don't just eat pizza. You're going to have a side of some sort. We'll right. say breadsticks with some garlic sauce. Like hitting 1,000 to 1,500 calories on a cheat meal is really, really easy. Well, 1,500 divides out if I'm in a 500 calorie deficit every day, that counts for three days of deficit. That's one cheat meal. If I had a cheat day, which a lot of people treat Sunday as your cheat day and I wake up and actually have breakfast too. Well, I've just added breakfast, which I don't normally eat. That's another day of weight loss that, you know, or calorie restriction that I've taken out. So now I'm four days of calorie restriction taking up in that. And those four days of calorie restriction were all supposed to add up to only a pound this week. Sorry, the seven days of of 500 calorie weight loss, uh, 500 calorie calorie restriction was supposed to add up to a pound. So now since I've canceled four of them, I'm actually only in a calorie deficit for three of them. So at best, I'm only going to see a half pound of weight loss this week. Now I'm discouraged because I'm doing all the things I'm supposed to do. I'm in a calorie deficit all the time. I'm mad because I don't get the food I want. And I have one good day a week that I really, really like and I look forward to. And I still don't get the weight loss that I'm looking for. 
this doesn't work. It's all bogus. I'm out. Yeah. So what does work for you when you're doing it and you're in your tight window? Uh, I've seen you do it. You know, you go through year after year. It seems mm-hmm. as though this is your. I think this is your five, maybe your six, where I've I've been very meticulous about counting every um, spring. So for you, counting is the way that works for you. Yep. There's no. So, so the way I go about it is I try and be very clear about where my zero is, and and that's that's the important starting block that I come from. Because if I don't know where my zero is, I don't know where my deficit is, and I establish a zero by doing that. You know, month of just watching what I'm eating right now. It's, it's smart that you do that. Uh, normally what I have found with my experience is it's almost as if without doing that, you find it by doing it and not getting results. So right. you're like, oh, you're not getting results. Well, it's because you, you, you ain't you burning 2,200 calories a day. You're five, six. Well, and the reason you know? I did that, the reason I, I look for my zero every year is because everyone says your metabolism slows down as you get older. And I'm getting older. I'm getting past, you know, past really, so really old. old. So they, they <laughs> say after the age of 35, I mean, think about how many people you know that say, oh, wait till you turn 35 and get a knee injury. You're going to have a spare tire on the gut with no problem. Like that's. Common You're knowledge. Way older than that. Way older than yeah, that. That's unfortunate. So at that point I was like, well, let's let's pretend this common knowledge, this common joke is not wrong. And I'll just assume that I have a lower number every year. So I need to find it again. I haven't found that my number's gone lower yet. Um, but I do stay pretty active and I do weight training throughout the year. So well, I, the that other, could be part of it. The other part of that too for most people is unless you have a really nice body fat really you're not looking for the body fat you're looking for the lean body mass Mm -hmm. but unless you really know your lean body mass probably for most people without continuous weight training because it gets a little bit farther apart i believe that most people are just losing muscle mass and they're getting fatter at the same weight and you just don't realize never realize that you were getting soft whether it be a hormonal thing or whether it be truly your intensity has changed Mm -hmm. and your nutrition has changed i think for most people I'm probably the most dedicated person I know to consistency. I would and agree. I'm not going to lie. When this second newborns come around, I've been a little bit lackadaisical in the weight room. So, sure. you know, when you think of as, as that happens to more and more people, I think that lean body mass number changes. And then the food that you're eating, you may think that you're maintaining, but it's actually you're maintaining a, a heavier fat mass. So it's kind of a different equation as well. You know what I mean? Oh, you're, yeah. You're not maintaining what you wanted to. Uh, I think it's really important that not only people get on the scale, you also get, and I don't know if you've done this. Have you done the zappers or done any format that can give you a general idea of your lean body mass? So the scale I've got at home, uh, and it's I think batteries are low, or I stepped on it too hard one time. I don't know which. And I also take really hot showers, so I might have just fried out the circuits with it. Uh-huh. It used to do uh, um, an estimate on your, your body fat percentage and also bone density and things like that. So it did all those things, and so up until this Again, year. probably not the most accurate. Probably but, not the most eh, accurate. Probably decent. But let's call it this. It's at least something that I can watch a trend on. Sure. And absolutely. that to me is the important thing on any of the things that I've been doing. Whether or not the accuracy uh, and even precision is that uh, high, as long as it's equivalent to itself, then I can at least track a trend. And, and I can trend over the past you know five years that I've been doing it, my fat percentage goes down. Um, I can also say that my fat percentage goes down at a lower rate than my overall weight loss. So I know that I'm losing body mass that is uh, lean body mass as well. So this year, every year I do a different experiment. Uh, early years I was doing, um, I'm going to uh, not eat breakfast, so intermittent fast. Lunch is just going to be fruit, and then I'll eat a normal meal at dinner. Uh, that made, I'll tell you what, that made dinners awesome. Made them really easy to do. And, and it wasn't, I was never hungry. That was the best part of it. I was like, I'm never hungry. I'm eating about 500-ish calories for lunch because uh, I'm eating any amount of fruit that I want. And then dinner was always wonderful. And I never had to restrict on dinner. Dinner was literally whatever I wanted to eat, I could eat. Within like, let's not get crazy. With right. the quotations around like, eh, pre-built, well, a little bit healthy, well, kind of. Yeah, let's call it whatever I wanted to eat, I could eat. No, yeah. there are people that wouldn't have wanted to eat what I ate and they would have an issue. So yeah. so that one went great. And it I run into that all the time though, the, the idea where you're. Oh, whatever well, what I do, want to eat. We want to eat two different things. Yeah. I've brainwashed I, myself over the last 20 right. years to like what I want to eat is rather different than what you're eating. Right. I, I don't drink soda. And and so I regularly, when I talk to different people about you know weight loss and, and things that they've been trying and things that work and don't work, 
um, my first question is almost always like, do you, what do you drink? Um, because I think liquids are really easy to forget and things like soda and things that have high calories and high sugar in them, you're going to end up bombing through 200, you know, calories really quick and just like an eight ounce can of soda. And so that to me is, is a really quick habit that you can get rid of that changes your entire, um, deficit versus surplus. So I, I digress a little bit, uh, but in, in that to say, I can eat whatever I want to eat because I don't want a soda and I don't want, you know, I do want cake and I do want, I do want ice cream. But so, you would eat that on that kind of a day? Absolutely. So that's the second part. We, uh, year, Hold the phone. Year two and three of doing my weight loss thing every single spring. I do, I'd start out the exact same way. I would check what my, uh, what my current zero is. I would put myself in a 500 calorie to, to maybe 750 calorie deficit, depending on what kind of speed I want to Playing with done. exercise in that number or not? Um, I, I would, at that point, I stopped tracking exercise on my watch, so it wasn't adding it in. Um, but I was, I was exercising. So I was still, you know, doing weightlifting. I was still doing hit style exercises, very, um, calisthenic based. So even on the bottom level, what, how many workouts a week do you think you were getting? Three, three at minimum, and then maybe four, but, but three was, so my let's normal. say three. And if you safely said, let's say 200 calories, not give you any extra possibly. So 200. Mm -hmm. So maybe you're talking 600 calorie cushion possibly. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I I looked at that too. Like, what it, would you say that maybe that's like almost literally a cushion of not recording accuracy? Yeah, I mean, there were there were times when I when I say I record my food, I record my food as is comfortably able. Like, I am not weighing anything, mm -hmm. and I, I had a friend who weighed his stuff, and his results were way faster and way more accurate and everything like that because he wasn't eating anything. I mean, he, I mean he was <laughs> and I can't I can't deny the man's willpower. Like he legitimately would weigh the food, cook the food, do the thing and he I mean he got cut and it, and it worked. It's it I mean it's a it's a testament it works to every the science. Time. So that said, I didn't want that. I it's not that I didn't want to be cut. It's that I didn't want the I didn't want to be so disciplined. You were lazy. You didn't want to do it. It sucks. Right. So I gave myself the fudging idea of I'm going to overestimate most of my food as far as volume per eat. Bingo. And then that would give me the the, the idea that at the next meal, well, I may be guessed right and I'm dead on, or maybe I guessed over and now I, I have like 200 extra calories that I'm not accurate on that I can make a mistake on this one. So I was always trying to overestimate my meals so that I, any any error I had was in the positive. Sure. Cuz so, you wanted the you you still wanted the results I, but you And I wanted it, to be lazy. Yeah, you made it easier. You that's what you got to do. Yeah. Yep. That's a good so, point. So so that one uh again it's like year 2 and 3. My my plan was um I wasn't doing fruit. I was doing a normal lunch, but it was low cal like low calorie lunch. I was still doing like 700 calorie lunches. Uh, I still had my workouts and then in the night I would eat less dinner because I wanted ice cream. And I had ice cream or dessert or some sort Every day. And that's not an exaggeration. I mean, every day. Girl Scout cookies start coming out about this time of year. I eat Girl Scout cookies. I love cookie dough. And I don't mean like, oh, I love making cookies. No. I mean, I like buying a tube of cookie dough and spooning the cookie dough into my face. Like, yum, yum. That's how I'm eating cookies. Yeah. This was every night. I always had it. And as long as it was under the calorie uh, number for what I would expect to eat for the day. And the good thing is, I can literally take a tablespoon and eat my cookie dough. So I know exactly how many tablespoons of cookie dough I'm eating. <laughs> a seasoned vet. Yeah, like I, I know how, how bad I'm being. I still lost on the exact same trend that I expected to. Now, health-wise, what other things were happening, I couldn't tell you because those, I would need blood draws to test. I would need, um, I would need calorimeters to... Uh, I, I would need calipers to start deciding like percent body fat. And I didn't do a lot of those things. So there's a very good chance that I was losing more muscle than fat during all that time. If you were exercising still, you know, I probably don't... not. Right. So, so that was my goal. Do and I have, ended up, do you have any idea what your protein count was throughout the day? Yeah. So I have never paid for any of the apps, which means I always get the free version. The free version doesn't let you go like bit for bit, but it does give you the general shot for the day. Like what does your day look like? So sure. my day on most of them, like if I was going to call my macros, I would say I was doing 40 to 60% carbs because remember I'm eating a lot of ice cream. So 40 to 60 carbs. And then the rest is, is about half and half on protein and fat. Uh, on the days that I was being really, really good, it was closer to the 40. 
which put me closer to you know the third 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 um but on the on most days i was probably closer to the 60. Um, so that was my 100 sport. grams 80 grams Ooh, that's what i mean so i don't know i don't know the gram content because you should use a different app, app. that I, app doesn't it, tell you the grams all i would have to do is pay for it and i just didn't want to well i think I've my fitness pal will give you the the grams Ugh, but then i have to re-enter all of this data yeah, it's been so yeah. nice all i have to do is is say i ate um i ate uh italian uh italian yeah, beef pasta you're, you're and it's already there and yeah. i'm like yes so the and it's funny you say that because i've had similar results in the sense that you can eat not perfect food and as long as the calories are right and you're doing the pieces of, well, you're either weighing everything or you kind of have the fail set. You, you overestimate and you do what you're supposed to do and you don't count all your exercise and pretend you had a 1,200 calorie workout and all those kinds of things. It does work every mm -hmm. single time. I've never had it not. Like I said, six years in a row trying a different way of, of, of restricting my calories. It, every way that I've done it has worked. And the interesting thing that I actually, it's funny, you're talking about ice cream and things and the way that you would do for building muscle, there's a lot to do with protein, mm -hmm. whether you're the camp that wants two grams per, whether you're the camp that wants one gram per, uh, whether it's 0.7, what the research is more showing anywhere in that range. If you're eating a super high protein diet and you're truly counting, you find out there's not many room, much room for carbs or mistakes or right. any of those things. So it's funny you say that because I've always thought about it. I tend to eat a lot more of the protein side of stuff, trying to build as much muscle as I can through the general way that I'm training to maintain muscle mass and or gain it is what I've pretty much generally done. But this is in like a longevity strength training format. I'm mm -hmm. not doing a bodybuilding yeah, split. You're, you're I'm not, not trying doing... to be massive. Right. And um, But my point to all this is it's kind of funny because I always envisioned, you know, if I wasn't so wrapped up in the requirement for protein and you have truly made the adjustment to eating certain types of foods and kicking the other out the door, there is an awful large pocket for nonsense that you could still eat very easily. Oh, yeah. There really so is. The days that I would have the best desserts would be days where I would eat like, oh, I'm going to have a pork chop, which is like a six ounce pork chop. And I wasn't lying because it came in the six ounce slab. So, sure. all right, I got a six ounce pork chop. I would eat uh, broccoli, six ounce pork chop and some rice. That's a super calorie light meal. I'd yeah. have like maybe seven to eight hundred calories in that meal if I if I ate a lot of rice or something. Right. Well, now I have so much room because I intermittent fast early in the morning, I have so much room to have like a whole milkshake. Now, two things to note there, a whole milkshake is what I said. Like that was the gluttonous thing that I had. Whereas most people are like, well, yeah, I have a whole milkshake every time I have a milkshake. No, like I had a whole small milkshake and that was wonderful to me. Right. So that's but you my think, habit. But you think like that day, if you're trying to build lean body mass, you wouldn't be able to do that because you are no. way shy of the protein. Number. Absolutely. And, and on, on those, on those days, those would be the days that when I looked at my macros, my protein numbers would be like only 20%. Yeah. Like I was way undershooting my macros because I just, that's not what I was eating that day. Well, and that, I think that's where a lot of the keto style diets, where the carnivore diets, a lot of those Atkins, a lot of those diets, if you follow their rules, that's why they're so advantageous for people that want to build muscle because you take all the thinking out of it. There's no questions. I'm not allowed to eat any of that stuff. Right. And you're going to meet that protein number. And uh, I don't know. I, I just, I wish that the picture was a lot clearer for most people. When you, you talk about eat less, yes, eat less. But if you eat better foods, it doesn't feel like you're eating less. Right. In fact, sometimes you're actually eating more and because, it, because of density. Right. And, and if you take the intermittent fasting concepts, the, the trouble for me, though, is it, <laughs> it always kills me. Fasting, intermittent fasting. Gregory, you skipped breakfast. You're yeah. not fasting. L let me let me let me unchurch it up for you. <laughs> and don't get it twisted. It's ten thirty AM, okay? <laughs> right. You you're, fasted a couple more hours. Yeah, you're eating your lunch now. Like I, it always kills me to hear these concepts. And then I really got a kick that research that we were talking about earlier. I got such a kick out of that with the mice. It's like to really be backing the idea of this intermittent fasting, that research just kind of like played into the idea. Well, and if we want to get really crazy, just to get for crazy's sake, for anybody that would have done that exact same study on a human, 
you're actually not hurting the human. Right. But you almost killed the rat. Like that study, if you if you go from that direction, you almost killed these rats. Right. But the people, like, uh, not a big deal. Yeah. It's just, it's what I do in the mornings when I forget to eat or I put my kids on the bus, but I woke up so late that I just had to run out before I got breakfast. Like, Well, that'll be the tough thing to see or test in the human population with the insulin dependence up and down with your insulins, the autophagy, what, whether or not you can prevent cancer. I mean, who's going to be signing up for this other than deathly ill people? And if you're deathly ill, is you that a going whole to be different motivation? Right. But isn't that going to be, unfortunately, I'm not positive that no matter how you set a study, whether or not the data is going to be great, because let's be honest, once again, we're not all just the same person. We're not all, you know, some people have bad hearts. Mm -hmm. Some people have bad genetics. Some people actually have diabetes right now. Yeah. We're not preventing it. I actually have it now. Yeah, so, so now I have to deal with that. You, you think about the major worry going down that road of, you know, what studies are you going to be able to cite that aren't deathly ill people and their impacts of insulin dependence and yeah. how it changed through fasting? Are they going to be the average Joe doing that? Uh, how are you going to be able to take someone that's willing to do a four-day fast twice a month. I mean, what job do they have? You just don't eat. You're cool with that. And we can test you for a year and you're not already are almost dying. You know, it's just, unfortunately, I'm not sure you're going to be able to get tremendous test groups that aren't ready are already. There are, there are people that have had those kind of test groups that can be randomized in that they didn't choose to be a part of the test group. The problem is their war crimes is what put them there. That's like true. There is a lot of tests that came out of World War II era where the Nazis were testing on the people in their prisons, which there was sadly a lot of medical advances that came from that because they were willing to do a test that was inhumane. But it gave a data set that is you can't get. Unattainable. Yeah, you can't get it another way. You have to subject people to calorie restriction for X number of days, weeks, months. You have to uh, restrict or the insane sleep study stuff they were doing. Yes. Like or, people and up. they would do so many things with like twin studies. So, well, yeah, I can really see what's happening without like watching the chemistry happen. I know your chemistry and your chemistry works exactly the same because you're the same people. Well, now you're that and you're that. And they they had so many studies that were un unique twin studies. They had identical twin studies. They had, again, this is all stuff that you cannot do to a human population, you should not do to a human population, and they were being done. Um, but that also means that data is really, really old, and the questions that we're asking today were not even measured right in the data sets that, that those studies would come from. And there are many people that would refuse to use those studies out of like just moral and ethical reasons uh, for any data that could be captured, because you also have a traumatized populace, which changes the hormone balance, which changes all kinds of things. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. Like the kind of studies that you would need to do to make things randomized for the general population is, is going to be so, so hard to accomplish. But we don't really need them to be able to experiment with ourselves. Like I can run a study every single year when I try and drop weight and try a different thing and see what works and what doesn't work and what I, what, what I feel good on and what I don't feel good on. And as long as I continue to like make a diary of those kinds of things, I can see for me what works. And if I'm not finding something that works, well, then I try the next thing and then the next thing. With my goal being, I intend to lose weight and feel good doing it. And then for you, you might find that the fasting is really the way that you want to do it because you get to be gluttonous in the times that you get to eat and the hunger goes away regardless of whether you ate or not. So that's the way I want to do it. I just know I'll never go over 24 hours because I start cramping. And then the next person gets it and they go, I just love the whole the whole 30. It's just easy. I don't have to think. I don't have to do anything like that. As long as I eat these types of foods, I'm good. It's all calorie restriction, as we've said, and it's all getting the same results. The question, and this is where it all hinges, is it something you can do longer term than the four-week to eight-week calorie restriction weight loss time frame? Right. And that's, or, that's the hinge. Or point. on the other side of it, uh, I've had great success managing my body fat because I test all of them. I don't even know that you couldn't go about it like that. Yeah. Uh, Are you I bored? do this on have January. Ever, I do this in February. I do this because I wanted to. Have you ever started a diet? Tell me you're not motivated. 
Right. Have it, okay, I got to do this. I need to get these Tupperwares. I got to set this up. What are we going to be doing on Tuesday night? I need to prepare for that. You know, once you get all these questions going, you're into it. You're motivated Ugh, for 30 days. I'm so tired of this now. I'll just start a new one. Yeah. Get off your hill. There is no hill. Yeah. They're all calorie restriction. You know what I mean? That's 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 the ultimate idea of if you're bored and you can't stick to it, the hierarchy of need is, can you stick to a calorie restriction or right. a balanced diet? Oh, you, you can't now. You're bored of this. You don't right. like a carnivore diet. I'm so tired of needing a handful of peanuts to be able to open my mouth. Isn't the peanuts diet? What was it called? Right. Yeah. No. Switch, switch, switch yeah, diets. So it's like, okay, I've but run But the trick its is don't allow the pendulum swing. You know, you don't. And, and I think as I've talked to different people that have done a calorie restriction of one type or another or a fad diet of one type or another, it works. Then they start getting discouraged and then they start gaining the weight back and they don't pull the chute early enough. Never, change diets. Try and ch- do it. Do something never else. Never stop getting on the scale. If you worked your tail off enough. To lose the weight. And I'll give you a prime example in myself. Okay. I do the same thing as you. I uh, cycle. So in the summertime when I'm doing lots of outdoor activities, boating with the kids, doing those types of things, I am not locked and loaded on perfect diet planning. Are we going to talk about your two years ago or maybe it was just last year where you just you didn't look at the scale for, for a while? Yeah, and I gained like 26 right. pounds. This is a good one. Yeah. So yeah, let's is, go through this. Yeah. So this is that, that's how I eat. Right. That's how I like to I'm eat. Gonna eat enough to gain 26 pounds in a year. Yeah. So, you know, not measure it. That was, what was that? Um, I think it was two years ago. Maybe three. I think it was three. We'll say three. I think it was three. Let's call, last year I didn't. So I guess let's it call was it 2019. Two, yeah. I it was before so. COVID. Yeah. Yep. So in that regard, summer came around doing tons of outdoor activities. The weight training started to fade more as I got addicted to skiing more and more on this chair. And um, I was doing that so much that I was so sore. I mean, doing learning all these flips and gymnastic moves, I was so sore that I stopped weight training. And one of the biggest reasons why I did was I felt like my biceps were going to tear. You know, all mm-hmm. that extra overload, getting right. jerked and things. I did biceps. I remember it. I didn't work out for like a week. And I'm like, I got to get back into this. Don't get off the, got to stay consistent. So I had a normal upper body workout. I was going to get back into my splits and I did biceps and I went for, you know, I did biceps like I like to do them. And I went and skied that day and I thought I tore my bicep. My right bicep was so mad for like four days. It took me quite a while. So that kind of led to where I, I was. Right, well, I just won't work out as much. I just yeah. Let me scale it back hurt. for a little bit. I got one more month, two more months left in the season. I wanted to get this flip down, so I need to be able to take the punishment. So yeah, I exnade the working out for probably the first time in I don't know fifteen, sixteen years. But you but you kept weighing in. No, no, I didn't do anything. Right. No, I didn't do anything. And there's two pieces of this. We'll talk muscle, and then we'll talk body fat. So what had happened? I always weigh. I should. I shouldn't say I never weigh. I didn't weigh every single day. I mm-hmm. jumped on the scale after three weeks, and I'm looking at it. And I'm, like, I'm still good. I can, I can deal with that. Yeah, 215. Two, um, I think at that time I was bouncing like 208, 209. And when I got up to like 213, I didn't think much of it. Well, the best part is you're like, pounds. well, you know what? I'm probably heavy today because I haven't gone to the bathroom yet. You give yourself the easy out. Right, right. Because so, you only me- measured once this week. Right, yeah. No big deal. I'm going to be just fine. Another week goes by, getting better and better at skiing. Still same boat, not working out, skiing every day uh, or as many as much as I can. And... I think it was like maybe the end of October. Yeah, it was okay. October to November when we had the conversation. Yeah, end of October, I started lifting again. And the surprising thing was is I was maybe 220, 221, which is probably the most I had weighed in a really long time, mm-hmm. and I was not working out. So I knew what this meant. It was soft. And what had happened was... <laughs> So what had happened? So I started lifting weights, and by week two, I gained another six pounds. Because mm-hmm. now you're now you're you're bulking now. Yeah. Well, one of the craziest things that I found in the, that whole cycle, and I tested it again to know whether or not that was the case. But just like carbohydrate or calorie restriction, you'll lose some water weight. You know, anybody that says that they've restricted their calories for five or six days, of course, you lost five pounds. It's all water. No fat. Yeah. No fat whatsoever. You can't burn fat that yeah. fast. It, it didn't happen. It's it's water. And what I found was interesting for those of you that are super 
consistent working out. They're out there. You're probably listening. When you start working out again, you will gain six, four to six pounds of water weight stored in muscles and all the other areas throughout your body that you did not know that your chubbiness is actually chubbier than you thought. Because mm-hmm. I didn't know, I didn't realize that. You know, when you're working out all the time, right? It, if you work out all the time and then you stop working out, yeah. And your, you weigh your the same, zero actually goes down a little bit. That's a bad thing if you right. weigh the same. Because so, your fat went up. Fat went up, lean body mass went down. And yeah, basically, so what I'd found that from June ish, a big back scale of working out to late October, I went from about 208 to 228. Mm-hmm. And I think 231 was my highest. So we're talking 20 plus pounds of, yep. of weight. Now, yep. now, we're also finding it was 20 plus pounds of mostly Just fat tissue. Just fat. Just yep. fat. All right. So now you've got that. Like, and I think a lot of people look at like a lot of people will look at someone like you and go, well, you don't really have that kind of issue. And there was a guy that uh, uh, I couldn't even tell you his name right now that went and he decided he was going to like gain 100 pounds of fat and, and take it back off. Just to try and see what are the, what are my what cli- yeah what do my clients have to go through and like mentally as as well as physiologically. So in this scenario, you are like many of your clients who come to you during um, your training sessions, trying to figure out how am I going to lose this twenty pounds? Which oh yeah for me like I've never had to lose twenty pounds. I've stayed within ten of what I wanted on purpose because I I watch my weight well, every as often as I can. That what you're doing I mean. You right. have to. So so now <laughs> you've, so long. you've gone over the 10, you're oh. in the 20. How did it go away? It took a really long time. The idea of how much fat you can lose week to week, the general consensus of things that most people have probably read is absolutely accurate. If you're losing more than one to two pounds of fat, you're most likely seeing water. You're saying if you're losing one to, more than one to two pounds of weight. Of body lo- fat. So... I think it's important that if, if you truly want to get great results and you want them to be lasting, I think you should not only be testing your weight, you should also be doing your body fat on a regular basis. Now, that body fat number is most likely not going to be extremely accurate. If you were to say you are a 15, it's probably not going to be that. But if you stick to but a it plan can trend it. and it's going to give you a trend that really works. And uh, I think the interesting thing is, is, the textbooks say 1% of your fat mass a week is about max. The bodybuilders say 1% of your fat mass. All of them all line up, and they do see the results because they have the grit and the grind to do it right. to get ready for a competition. Yep. It's D-Day. Got to be there. And I would say in every single version of doing any of these cycles, it's exactly true. If you're losing more weight than 1% to 2%, which – tends to be pounds for most people. So say you weigh 300 pounds and you find that your your fat mass is X. Well, if you take 1% of that, basically that is probably going to be your most optimal results that you could achieve is 1% of your fat pounds mass. Does that make sense? So that would mean if I, if I we'll, we'll just say I go home and I buy one of those electronic um, fat mm-hmm. percentage thing. Yeah. It says that I'm 30% um, and we'll do easy numbers because I'm terrible at math. It says 30% of my body fat is fat Mm -hmm. or sorry, 30% of my body weight is fat. And for, again, for easy numbers, we'll say I weigh a hundred pounds. This is a weird looking human, but (laughs) I weigh a hundred pounds. That means 30 pounds of that hundred pounds is fat. That's what 30% means. Yep. So it's really easy math. This stuff's easy to sort through. And then you sit there and you go, if I'm losing 1% of my 30 pounds, what is that number? So you can, plug in whatever number you are at home and whatever Bingo. number you were and get your actual numbers that you're trying to lose per week then. That is the meat and potatoes of like real fat loss. Mm-hmm. It's not just weight loss. It's fat loss. Yeah, you Do don't want to lose, lose the other stuff. Yeah, you don't want to lose lean body mass. You don't want to lose anything other than fat. So if you truly wanted to do this, you use the scale as an indication of success. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is... If I get on the scale in the morning, then that is my most dehydrated point of the day. Yep. That's my lightest. That's mm-hmm. my light stomach, eating proper food. I mean, I've digested everything. That's probably going to be my lightest. Most people say just to get on the scale in the morning. I say get on the scale in the morning and the night. The reason for that is because when you get on there at night, it is an insanely easy way to know whether or not you counted 
correctly. And for me, counting calories is absolutely essential to learn the foods that you're eating. It teaches you what foods you you should be eating. Mm -hmm. It most definitely helps you control portion sizes. But it is not something that anybody, unless you're sick and twisted, wants to do for 10 years. Right. So generally, you kind of come out of this with a game to play, right? I learn everything through the calorie counting. Now let's play the game that works for me, which, easiest example, carnivore diet. Think about it in the other way. Okay, so if I needed to be the X amount of calories less, and, da, 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 and then all you said was, if I need two grams per pound of body weight, and I need, oh, well, why don't I just eat meat? If I just eat meat, you mean to tell me that I don't have any of the excess carbohydrates? Mm -hmm. I don't have retaining water. I'm literally looking at a lot of lean body mass coming in and out, right? I've built in a calorie deficit because I physically can't eat that much meat. So that's the game. You just mm -hmm. made a game. It's a carnivore diet. That's what right. we call it. I don't think anymore. I don't count anything, right? right? So in this world, that's, that's what I think the scale does a great job of that once you're done calorie counting or you've got a great baseline of what you generally eat. Portion control, uh, food choices, and things like that. Right. So now you've got the groundwork played out. And now I go, okay, so if my scale is swinging five to six pounds, if I'm not seeing that lower number in the evening, whether I'm matching it and or within one to three pounds, I know I overate. That day. That day. Mm -hmm. So if I know I overate, and it's a trend between three to five days, and I get it. Don't get me wrong. If you eat something really salty, guess what? You're probably going to retain more water. That's mm -hmm. not the point. Right. What did you eat that was so salty? You probably ate fried something. You know what Could I mean? Yeah. Does that make sense? Like, sure. You shouldn't have eaten that anyway. So it's not that like every intricate detail of the nighttime scale the, is like... It's the trending. It's the principle. It's the seven day, the 15 day, the 20 day, the 30 day. Does your nighttime number match your morning number? How far is it? Because it, 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 it won't and it shouldn't. It shouldn't be the exact same. Or it should same. be pretty darn close. But it should when be When you're losing. Right. When you're right. losing. So you want to know what happens? I've done it for probably eight years. I've used it on... I don't know, 350-ish clients, happens every single time. Say you weigh 200 pounds in the morning and you weigh 206 at night and you do that and you don't try to lose one ounce. It'll literally do that probably most every day depending on what you did. Did you drink too much alcohol? Well, guess what? 200 might be 198 after you get good and dehydrated. Did you eat a bunch of fried food? It might be 207. It's a little bit of a swing. But generally, if you're eating healthy foods and you're finding that sweet spot, it'll be arranged most every day within probably three to six pounds. Well, and, and probably your, regular, other. your regular bowel movements and things like that are also getting right. rid of Which excess. also comes with better eating foods, better food. eating all the stuff. So what will happen is when you start dieting, your range will most likely move from 200 to 206. It'll probably be 196 or 197 to 203 within the first seven days because you're going to take a little chunk of water weight and a little chunk of bloat and a little chunk of whatever, and it's going to show you that you're eating less, and that comes from the calorie restriction. Both ends drop down. You will see it every single time. And then if you smash food on a Sunday or you overeat with your cheat meal, guess what? That 206 is right there again. Yep. It doesn't really mean that you've lost mass. It's a water weight thing. Mm -hmm. So that's where that cheat meal, when you jump on that scale morning and noon every night, that's the game you're playing. And you go, I keep seeing 206. It's because you have not lost any fat. Right. Right. You haven't lost any. So what you'll see when you're getting results is you'll see, so let's take our 206. So now we're 197 to 203. And then all of a sudden, 197 is 201, 197 is 200, 197 is 201, 196 is 199. Whoa, hold the phone. What was that? 197 is 198, 197 is 204, 196. Oh, what happened? That's how it happens. Mm -hmm. so, so the closer you get that nighttime number to match it, it's an easy indication that you know that all your calculations are occurring right. if you want to get detailed, or you know that you're going to hit your number. And that's right. just all there is to it. It's, it's Again, giving you a day-to-day -day snapshot to better assess a trend that you're looking at over across a week and a month. Right, and, and, and very structured and simple, mm -hmm. but all prefaced with you are a reflection of what you eat, mm -hmm. you are eating healthy foods, 
unfortunately. You know, it, right. it, it you, is what it is. You have to change your, but now, your intake style. So, so take your ice cream and your examples like that, right? Mm-hmm. If you eat a lot of carbohydrates, that game, that swing game can be bigger. Yes, because and it was. It very much was because I would. Uh, my standard is to weigh myself every morning. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you were talking about this, again, it's three years ago, two or three years ago, I started doing morning and night, and, and that was the same time I was doing my ice cream evenings. And it was. I had a very uh, wide um, span. It was still going down, um, and I still saw my 10 pounds of loss, but at the in the evenings, I would be that much higher. Now, and we both th- talked about this. Since then, when I've lost the same 10 pounds, like last year, you even commented, you look a lot leaner this year. And that speaks to that that gap, that, that span. Because that time, my span was like one to two pounds. But during the you know 2019 year, that span was close to six pounds um, on my morning and night weigh-ins. So yep. yeah, I mean, there's there's some I, there's some truth that I've at least experienced in that. Right, and I actually, on a side note, that's the one downside of low carbohydrate diets: the ketos, the carnivore style. When you make a mistake, it is insanely depressing to get the realization that you have not lost any weight. Yeah. And I think that that's one of the easiest ways to kick anybody out of the confidence game is if you don't actually understand the victories. Mm -hmm. The victory is actually not the scale. The scale is a game you're playing Mm -hmm. to realize result. And to realize result, it is with a body fat caliber that tells you when your lean body mass is hopefully remaining the same while your fat mass decreases. So when you truly are looking at weight loss, the scale is a terrible indication of fat. Yes. It's an indication of explaining to you in a fast way whether or not you're playing the game correctly. We know that if we have a lower weight on a range, you're most likely eating less carbohydrates, which is most likely a good indication that you have a deficit. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. And I say, mm-hmm, but I, I'm sitting here going like, I'm doing a little bit of mental gymnastics to sort of, you're saying the range from morning to night, when it gets smaller, you're probably eating less carbohydrates, and therefore it's easier for you to stay in your calorie deficit because they are calorie-dense foods that are missing from your diet. Yes. Okay. Yep. Then, yes, I am tracking. Yes. The, the, the scale is a tool to understand that your choices that day were good ones. Mm-hmm. and it's very easy to do. It doesn't require all the counting. It doesn't require all those things. And if you pair it up with an eating window, that's something that I've found a lot of success with, that if you are a glutton and you're not able to maintain or control your mouth during the day... Eating, to be clear, this is this is you. We're speaking th- of this you. This is me, yeah. and probably a lot of people that are overweight. I mean, they just like to eat too much food. Mm-hmm. So if you like to eat too much food, the intermittent fasting concept or an eating window can be very effective if you like to overeat. Some people don't. I secretly hate them. <laughs> I secretly dislike the idea that you don't want to you stuff just, your face. You're just okay not doing that. Yeah, I mean, my wife's like that. She, she'll literally not eat for most of the day. And then she'll want to go out to eat and she'll eat like half of what she orders. And I'm like, if we go out to eat, I'm going to eat so much food. Right. Because that's the way this body operates. But again, it's, it's you have to, I'm not as much into the fasting from the science. I'm into, I like to eat big meals. Mm-hmm. So if I'm going to eat a big meal and I know the calorie game is really what we're playing, then I can do it without counting anything. That if I eat barely anything at lunch, and I'm remember I, I'm a negative Nancy. I'm mm-hmm. talking about, oh yeah, I don't really eat lunch. I, well, I'll I just had, have a protein shake. I had turkey and cheese. Yeah, and my goal is to go eat nothing. If I'm a little hungry in the day and know I need to get to 150, 60 grams of protein, that means that by noon on I got to start getting a little protein consumption because I'm probably only getting 60 at its best for dinner. Right. So if I'm playing the protein game. Then if I eat between 12 and 8 o'clock and I stay on that, then I don't have to count or do anything as long as I follow my concept. A protein-based snack, about four meals within that 12 to 8-hour window. Most of the snacks are going to have 30 grams of protein. I already have my habits all taken place. I don't have to count anything, and I know what I'm going to get when I look at the scale. I did eat too much for dinner. 
Mm-hmm. Dang it. So this sounds like it sounds Another like a game to play. Would it, yeah, it sounds like you lost 20 pounds. You lost 20 pounds by playing a a different game that time, but essentially the yeah. same game all over, yeah. which is calorie restriction. Right. And that one was easy enough for you because it fit all of the ways that you already like to be. Yeah, I want to eat a lot when I eat. Right. So I want to make sure I save it to when I'm going to eat. I I need to have protein, so I'm going to have a protein heavy um, snacking habit. Not, I'm not going to eat anything other than protein for snacking because I just need protein, and I know I'm not going to get enough of my big my big meal at night. And then uh, that alone is going to make sure that I stay in a calorie restriction, and I check it by doing my weight in the morning and nights and just see if I'm coming in close. How long did it take? Lose 20 pounds. How long did it take? It took exactly the amount of time that it would take to lose 20. So if I was 220 mm-hmm. and you took – that that's what's always crazy is you lose in intervals. Your body doesn't give you consistency. So right. if you drew a line graph and you took 1% of my fat mass and you put every single week – you could have divided it out and it was like literally to a T the exact amount. So day to day lose, it's going like this, but across the trend, it's a straight line yeah, so, with a perfect trend. Yeah. So if you took 1% of my fat weight and I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, barely any though. I was super lean. I believe it. Yeah. So when you took it though, and again, that that's what's depressing though, is you might physically have to lose well, let's think about it. So 231, mm-hmm. I physically had to lose 20 pounds to weigh. Well, I'm saying that wrong. 231, I physically lost 31 pounds on the scale. Because mm-hmm. you got down weigh, to 200. To weigh when I was done restricting heavily, like 208. Isn't because that funny? on your low end, it was 200. Yeah, the game is past it. The game mm-hmm. is calorie restriction, means less water, means less bloat, means less blah, 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 mm-hmm. means five, six, seven pounds. Right. So when you take five, six, seven pounds, and then you get rid of the restriction, you get to gain that back. But so it doesn't go up anymore. It just, you you've, get your bloat you get back, your flat line. and then your flat line stays there, as long as you're staying at your current calorie zero. That, that's what's crazy. So it, for most people, when you get on the scale and you see that you lost 10 pounds, well, yes, did, are you 10. down 10 pounds for seven days? If you're down 10 pounds for seven days, then I'll say, okay, you probably lost two. Well, yeah, I was going to say you, you're – I'll let you keep going. I'm just saying, though, if, 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 if someone comes to me, and I, I've had this happen many times, say you're 250 pounds, and now all of a sudden you're 240 pounds. If you are nine weeks in – You probably lost a lot of fat because you're already rolling. In the beginning phase, the most dire time, in my opinion, because people want to see results Mm -hmm. and they need to see them stick. But if you get your mind wrapped around, again, this comes like the reflection idea and all those Mm things. If you get your mind wrapped around that you add five or six pounds to any number you see, then it it is very much realistic from the get, right? right? So if from the get I'm 250, I get in this calorie restriction. I feel good. I'm working out. I'm sore, but I feel good. Mm -hmm. 242. Week two weigh in. I'm weigh in. Down 10 pounds. Love it. So what I like to make sure that anybody realizes, add seven to eight pounds of that because it is all water retention and those types of things from your stuff. So you may have lost two pounds. And if you take the zap machine. Which is good. Yeah. Like that's the thing. That's good. Get your head wrapped around the game, right? Mm -hmm. The game is that number. The game is not what's on the scale. Mm -hmm. And the more that you can get your head wrapped around what really matters, diet, 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 diet. No, no, no. Calorie restriction. That's what you're playing. You know, uh, fat loss, fat loss, fat loss. (sighs) The scale doesn't, I weigh the same. It's because you do. You know, if you, how many people I've ever seen go from 250 to 240 if I had a dollar? And then when they stopped, they were 252. Um, mm-hmm. It would blow your mind. you know. So, so I do want to ask a question because I think this is a pretty important one that, that, will, that expresses how a lot of people experience this moment, especially if, if we're non, non-working out population. Because um, I experienced it when I started working out and doing, I'm talking like weightlifting working out. Or um, yeah, some sure. sort not, of not bodybuilding. Mm-hmm. Any of you listeners, no, just, we're not doing... talking about bodybuilding. We're talking about being in shape. And just going into the gym and yeah. doing a standard like a standard weight based workout. So uh, my wife is one of these people. Uh, I've been one of these people. I think many people have this experience, especially if the if the scale is the way I'm determining whether I'm succeeding or not. Right. 
You start on our um, calorie restriction to a degree. Maybe we're just staying at calorie zero, and I start working out. And all of a sudden, I weigh five pounds more. And well, I don't mean I, all of a sudden. I don't mean like day one or day two. I mean like week three. And I alluded to that earlier. Right. I, so, so what's happening there in a more um, specific to this scenario th- conversation? Th- think about it like this. There, There's literally... The only way to explain it, it's way more complicated, but think of it as literally two different systems doing nearly the same thing. If you calorie restrict, the scale will go down five or six pounds. If you haven't been lifting or working out whatsoever, you also have water weight and retention in other ways in the muscle world as well. So, you know what I mean? If you don't restrict your calories whatsoever Mm -hmm. and you're eating say 2000 calories and you're not restricting at all, and then you start working out for most people, if you've worked out before Mm -hmm. or you have potential for, I shouldn't say potential. If if you're going to work out in a way that actually gets results, there's an awful lot of people that go through the motions and I wouldn't call that working out. If you're doing muscle based workouts and you're, if I go in and I get sore. Yeah. If you, if you're truly getting in a good workout and you haven't worked out in months and months and months, you will gain three to five pounds, probably like clockwork. Every single time the scale will go up. Going from zero workout to workout three to five pounds. And a lot of it just has to do with water retention and the way that your body's holding on to things. You are creating building blocks. We have to build muscle. Mm-hmm. My body has to repair. We need tools to fix those muscles laying around. And I need those tools to in. stick into the places where they're doing the work. Right. Yeah. I mean, think about it like that. It's a, You've got a tool shed that's now all the tools are laying on the ground. We're going to hold a little bit more stuff. We're getting more cement, building blocks. Okay, we're good. So this system now has has what it needs to repair these muscles. When you calorie restrict in the same way, you're going to get a drop in weight. So there is oftentimes a lot of people that either, and and that's a really good question. Let me explain why. Small women that are five, five or less struggle with weight loss an awful lot. I've worked with an abundance of them. And what I've always found is that is nearly the exact quote verbatim Mm -hmm. after week one, every time they work out and in the first week they gain weight. And most of the time, the realization at which they haven't actually moved their calories into a deficit, they've actually moved to a maintenance level Mm -hmm. and now they're working out. So let's think about that. They were gaining weight every single day by what they were eating and just didn't realize it because their metabolic burn is where it is. Yeah. If you're an and office probably worker, small. you can even say like, we don't have to gain a pound a week. We sure. can be gaining, we can be gaining 10 grams a week. Yeah. So 3,500 calories is a pound. So say you're just a thousand up in a week. You're not going to see, well, I guess you could even say less, say you're 400 up, but you're still 400 up. So if you literally cut out 500 calories in your diet, let's be honest, that is Across a week, 500 across a week. 100 of 135. I mean, you're talking like three, four, probably butchered, but maybe 4% of what you need Mm -hmm. to lose a pound. So what would you call that? Nothing. Yeah, you're there. A wash, you're at maintenance. And that's what I think um, is happening more often than not is that bracket, that demographic, that type of an individual is actually gaining weight every single day. And when they join some kind of an initial phase workout program and or eating schedule, they get really close to maintenance because they're shocked at how little they truly have to eat unless they change every food they eat Mm -hmm. to super healthy foods, then they'll get to eat more. But you brought it to a maintenance, then you worked out, and now you're retaining a little bit more water and you gained three pounds. And everyone's insanely depressed. And I say, well, let's look at your caloric intake because probably you didn't We should have gained. If we gain, that means you're not eating few enough calories Mm -hmm. or your choices are terrible. Or you didn't work out before and this is your fluff. And I think the reason I want to bring any of that up because it is weight loss is, I would say, 90 percent mental. The the consistency, the system, the system is the system. Whatever system you choose that creates calorie restriction is effective. It just is. It's. When the basic system is right, calorie restriction um, versus calorie, you know, use, you're going to lose. How you do that, how you get there, how you decide to maintain that, that's the game. The, that That's the 90% we're talking about. Right. And I think it, in those moments, those, but I thought I was doing the calorie restriction. I thought I was doing the thing and I still gained. That's that fluff area. That's that, like you 
like you kind of alluded to, you got the two systems. You've got the system that's repairing muscle and building muscle, which is going to use water and bloat to, to make sure that it can do, you know, some of those things and float those There's building blocks. a lot of blocks. amino acids and things that are just yeah. going to be retained, too. I'm it's floating just, building blocks. Yeah. I'm, putting, I'm putting reserves in that muscle, glycogen-wise. I'm, I'm doing things. But then in addition, I have the weight loss side of things where you've got the fluff of just like, I just retain water because I have more calories in me. And so I just, I float it a little bit more. Well, when both systems are being activated in different sides, you'll feel like I've, I've lowered it all. But this side's still going up because you also started working out. But then that's uh, that leads you to like more or less that's the complete example of when calorie counting, oh, that can't be working. I must have an insulin problem. Right, but I must have a there's something else. It's it's this, it's that, it's But that's uh, where the profit the you know, the it's really helpful to have a weight trainer. It's really helpful to have uh, you know, a nutritionist, it's really helpful to have somebody who has seen it happen enough times to then go, Hey, this is what's gonna happen. It's gonna upset you. We keep working. The moment that this is gonna be important is at the end of four weeks. At the end of four weeks, you'll be able to look back. You know, we talked about Dorian Yates a couple weeks ago. And Dorian Yates was like, you're never going to see like five pound gains across a week anymore once you're past a certain point. But he goes, when you see one and two pound gains every week, we do that for 50 weeks. That's 50 pounds. It's the same thing on weight loss. When you, when you lose a half a pound a week, well, across a day, I didn't see any change. And that gets frustrating. And across three days, I didn't see any change. And in fact, across two weeks, I didn't really see any change. But across four weeks, I've actually lost four pounds. That's a pound a week. That means something. And now you do that for two months, well, and that that's will, eight pounds. Yeah. Like, that's a big deal that, that a lot of people undersell because it it takes so long. And, it, and your, when it's your a little motivation. Bit of swings. You get swings, too, though. Like True. Some, yes. some you might have three pounds, and then one you might have one, and then one you might have zero. But again... Might gain one. Yeah, if you had the discipline to do it for eight weeks and... Uh, you could stick to it. You might find that you lost eight pounds and most of it was in the back end or some of it was in the front end. It's just whatever your body will give you. Um, and then being able to maintain your motivation and discipline to stay with it, even though the scale day to day is not showing you what you want to see. This part of the conversation like leads me. That's where I think that discipline and testing and experimenting extreme things can be a very powerful tool because a 37 hour fast, that's the first time I have not eaten food in my entire life for a day. Hmm. And when you think about it like that, hunger, hunger doesn't, I'm a big eater. Mm -hmm. You mean to tell me I can make it through a whole day and not eat? Well, I mean, it brings thing into perspective. You're going to be a grouch. You're going to be awful. Of course that's true. But then and it yet, wasn't. It wasn't. Yeah. And the carnivore diet. Am I saying it's the best thing for everybody? I would say there's a, probably a whole lot of people that actually couldn't do it. I actually know uh, several individuals that can't eat steak because it eats up their stomach. Mm -hmm. If you can't eat steak, I don't even know how you would attempt the diet because that was by far the most satiating food you could eat. All of a sudden, you find you're not eating any chicken because it tastes terrible without any type of topping on it. Um, or unless you want to marinade, which again, you couldn't do, you know, you were, I was doing a sugar version yeah. of it. Sugars are in most marinades. The only thing that you could eat that was like, Oh, I feel pretty good was a steak. Mm -hmm. So whenever you do these types of things, I think it's insanely easy to control all the variables on a more structured diet plan that allows for more freedom. You, your example of calorie restriction, still eating ice cream. I don't know that you could really do that type of a, a game plan if you were trying to really put on a lot of lean body mass. No. Because you would have eaten up too many of your calories in the restriction, not yep. being a protein-based approach. No, every day that I did it, I was I was bad on macros. My macros were awful. But probably 98% of the people out there could insanely benefit from the idea that all you need to do is restrict your calories and play that game. And if you get bored and you find that you can't keep restricting your calories, then play a different game for a little while. Mm -hmm. or, and, and then, or, or take a break and go back to maintenance level for a while. Yeah. If you take a break for just two weeks and go to a maintenance level, first of all, you, go, you get to give yourself back 500 calories a day. That's a huge deal. It feels great. Now, the maintenance level, you're going to see that five-pound swing up again because you're going back to your bloat. 
which is fine. You knew it was coming, the five pounds is coming, and it's not an actual five pounds. It's just the cushion that you were already going to have once you stopped being in a deficit. So as long as you're prepared to see the five pounds come, because it'll go right back away as soon as you start your deficit again. As soon as you know that that's coming, you spend your two weeks going back to a normal thing and say, now I'm going to kick back into this diet. That might give you the mental longevity you needed to continue down for another 10 pounds. Sure. And then hesitate. And then. The but the reflection thing, thing mm-hmm. what you're saying there, that the, the most depressing thing about the whole deal that always comes is everyone always gains it back. Mm-hmm. And the reason is, is because you don't, you don't get it. The whole, <laughs> you know, the little saying, well, it's a lifestyle. You've got to embrace it. It's the Zen. It's, 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 it's true. Train for a lifestyle. That's what it Did must be. Did you just saw? Woo saw. <laughs> train for the life. But it, what's funny though, is that if you think about that in real terms in a different way, and that's where I've come up with this reflection concept, because to me, it hits home with the idea that if I'm thinking of it in terms of deficit, to me, I get cabin fever after a while. If I'm thinking of it in terms of reflection, I am going to be the amount of food I'm eating will be my lean body mass meets fat. Mm -hmm. Then I, in turn, have to figure out what collections of foods make me look like that. Yeah. You and, basically eat like the person. I mean, I've heard many people say that. Eat like the person yeah. you intend to be. Yeah, and if if you don't realize that like, no, 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 that is how much food you have to eat to be that size because it takes less for your body to move in general, whatever. You know, mm-hmm. like the calories lower because you weigh less. You have less fat mass on you. You burn less calories during exercise. Everything about your body composition changes when you lose all that mass. So when it comes to that point in time, when you get the realization that if you even want to get littler than that, it too probably has to change that equation. Mm -hmm. You either have to exercise more or you have to eat less or you have to eat way cleaner. Yeah. Because it's, that's the new you. Yeah. It's funny too, because there's, you kind of hint at uh, the processes that, that burn calories there because you're like, you either eat you either eat less or you you do more and there there's like really four ways that your body uses like spends energy and those four ways i think are the things that people like oh well it's probably just getting lost in the numbers it's not like the numbers are all there you got your basal metabolic rate which is just you're alive it means it keeps your temperature up heart beating and and lungs working like that's your basal then you've got your uh, how much energy does it cost to digest a food Because different foods cost different energies to digest. So that's another amount of calories you can dump in there. So the the common one is like, oh, it costs more energy to digest celery than calories that it gives you. That's the extreme example. It probably is true because it's it's mostly like shoestrings and water. Like it's nothing. So you got those two things. And those you can't really do much about. Like I can't put a hand on those and crank them at all. My basal metabolic will go up and down with with things that are happening that are kind of outside of my control. The type of food I eat, I can eat a higher threshold, um, like it costs more energy to burn this food. I can eat more of that. That's helpful. I can put a knob on that. But then the other ones are your activity levels. And I think most people are aware of that one. Oh, I exercise more. I get to put a hand on that crank and turn up my, my calorie usage in a day. So calories in goes down because I'm eating a different kind of food. Calories out goes up because I'm exercising more. But there's this other weird one. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about it. That is the one that is, it's like the ghost number. And it's the one that everyone like can either be blaming for the problems. It can be blaming for their, their results. Could be like, it's a really weird number. And it's, it's the NEAT score, which is like non-exercise. So this is not intentional movements to um, lose weight or to lose calories or to do any of those things. It's non-exercise activity thermogenesis. So this is everything else you do in a day from walking. Turn your head, look up and down, swing your hand around. Walking walking down the hall to get the, the paper off the printer. Like all of those things count into this number. And the weird part about it is, and there's not, not a ton of studies that really nail it down because the amount of blood draws you'd have to do and the amount of, but there's at least enough studies to recognize that there is a hormonal shift that occurs. When you start calorie restricting, your body starts becoming less motivated to do those things. 
And that looks like everything from like, I don't bounce my leg as much. That looks like everything from like, the remote's all the way across the room and I really don't like this show, but I'm not going to change the channel because I don't want to go all the way over there to get the remote. Um, it looks like I become very aware of how many times I got to go to the printer. So I'm going to print all of my things off right now. So I only go there once and then I come back. All of those things add up uh, most of the time on the background. Like I don't, I don't have my hand on this dial because I'm never thinking about this dial. And that dial can have everything from like as low as a, a couple hundred calories on it to like four, 600 calories on a person that is a lot more just naturally active. That is a huge number when you're trying to discern where your baseline zero is. Well, you think about these apps are recommending that you cut 500 calories out a day. So if you're talking about general movements throughout the day and moving more gets you three to 400 calories, it can have a major impact if... yes. Well, and especially if that occurs and you don't know it. So, all right, I found my zero. And this is, this is kind of what I, what I think happened a couple of times during mine where I had, to, I had to further restrict my calories. I'd hit my zero. I know where my zero's at. I go 500 under that and I start losing my weight. And then I hit that plateau where I'm like, well, why am I not losing weight anymore? Well, I haven't realized that I've become just that much more efficient. Whether it's the exercise that I'm doing, that I'm more efficient in my exercise but I'm also more efficient on just my day. Yeah, personally, through people I have helped along the way, and even myself, I think the plateau is absolute bogus. And the only reason I say this okay. is because it's a real thing. Sure, yeah, I was going to say, you can't call it bogus because everyone experiences it. But your body just does not want to lose any more fat. And right. it's all of the little things at which it's not really a plateau when you made 27 mistakes in the last three days, but they were just little ones because you're trying to stay on it right. and you're doing so good, but you keep making all these little mistakes and then you kind of not moving as much. You missed a workout day and it's kind of like, it's not literally a plateau. It is literally the point in time when your body is flipping you the bird and doing anything that it can to make you just go smash some food right. and get the fat burn process to stop. Right, because it's, it, it's not that it doesn't want to burn calories. It's just that it wants to burn the easy calories, which yeah. is not the fat calories. Right, right. So, so the plateau, in my opinion, it's not a real thing that's preventing you. It's not a blockade that's set up. It is an, it's a million hurdles that just got placed in your way that if you can jump over them and you can develop the discipline through maybe some of these fasting techniques through extreme dieting things in a short window, if you've got the will that you created in all those fashions, there's not really a plateau when you're aware that your body is setting you up to fail in a fat loss sense, then you know that this is the time where either maybe you could throw in a fast really mm -hmm. wrench at something and, and Here's, well, it's, here's it's one the example. sabotage. Yeah, like you are being sabotaged both by your body, your hormones, by everything around you, by yes. your friends who are making food and doing things like that. Like you're being said, like right. you are not. This is not a. Uh, I don't want to say victimless client. The, the, there is a perpetrator. It is everyone is against your fat loss. Yeah, it is. It, yes, most definitely. But like here, here's a, an example of the the game that I play. Right. So whenever you start eating a lot of carbohydrates and sugars and you get lots of spikes, mm -hmm. your ghrelin levels go really high when it's time for hunger. And what's and ghrelin? I, uh, ghrelin is a hormone that's released that makes you feel hungry. Okay. And it can subside whether or not you eat. But when it comes on, it can be very strong if you have a very glucose-oriented diet. Lots of carbohydrates, a lot of fast-acting sugars. Your ghrelin threshold comes more frequent and it comes okay. more heavy. All right. So what I find to be a great tool in that world is, do you want to quit having hunger spikes? Do you want to quit all those things and, and try to get on? I don't like saying no. I'm a yes person. I love yes. I love yes. Mm. What I would suggest or what I do is go make a monster steak. Through my carnivore diet, I know that the most satiating food that I can possibly eat is a steak. And if you overload your satiating feeling mm -hmm. and you really pack your stomach not full of carbohydrates but full of an enormous steak and i'm talking like 12 to 16 ounces yeah like, eat a huge portion of steak and then back that up 
with big time calorie restriction, you will find it to be an easy, easy transition. If you come into some kind of a heavy caloric restricted diet mm -hmm. and you are high rolling off of sugar highs and lows, that day it's not even discipline. It's torture is what it is. Yes. It's not fun. It's not enjoyable. You're hungry all the time. You don't really feel like you can get out of the funk. And if you grind for two or three days, you will get in that window of bliss of burning fat, using ketones, blah, blah, all these different things. You will get to that level. But if you want to negate some of these things, that's a really good tool to utilize. If you want to go to a calorie restricted heavy week, smash a steak and I mean eat all of it and be miserably full and start the next day and you will lose all of those up and down crashes and runs and your ghrelin levels will be much more level and again it comes from experience you learned it through the carnivore diet I learned the most satiating way to do it but when you do that it makes that way 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 easier to well, get into and then what you're doing if you're smashing a steak as your as your way to combat your hunger you're now changing your um, sugar spikes because yeah. you're hitting it with something that won't spike your sugar the same way. Yeah. And so now your ghrelin levels will start responding and you get a lower and lower like, uh, it's, like it's, anger crave. Well, it's the ultimate Monday diet breaker. You know, for, for most people, they're going to start their diet on Monday. And the amount of people that I have worked with that start their diet on Monday and eat just the biggest load of crap on a Sunday – you make it near impossible to stick to it because mm -hmm. if you suffer through Monday, Tuesday is no better. Yeah, it's you just you spent all your discipline on Monday, and now you're just angry and right. calorie deficited on Tuesday. That's a word. Yeah, you deficited. should. Yeah, if you, ever you want to start a diet, it should start with just the monstrous steak you could possibly eat and some greens. That's how you should start your just diet. Just hit it with something very calorie, not dense, yeah. but just filling. Yeah, but it, so it, say if you're going to start on a Monday, let Monday be your monster steak night. Because if you're going to end it on pizza and all that, you're going to be so miserably hungry that Monday, Tuesday, that it, it's not a good way to start the process at all. No, that's a, I mean, that's a good tip. It's it's I think those are the things that help. I mean, definitely help me in those moments. So like this year was a good example. We We came up this year with a... I was trying to do my, my weight loss that comes about this time every year. We're getting ready to go to um, Florida. I don't I don't wanna look I wanna yeah. look I wanna look tight. I yeah. wanna look uh, I wanna look hard bodied in Florida. Yeah. So yeah. I'm I'm getting ready for Florida and um and I and I want it to be I I want to also account for the five pounds that I'm gonna get back when it's time to You're not you gonna know, overeat there, are you? I'm gonna I'm gonna overeat and over drink a little bit many. Wait, what? That's the plan. I'm going with that plan. You're gonna have like I think they call it fun. A skosh of fun. I'm going <laughs> to put a side of fun next to a skosh of fun. So so I know this coming up. This is, this is my plan. I'm, I'm going for it now. And I hit the plateau, and I started thinking through, like, to me, the plateaus are spots where, like, all right, well, look back at what you're doing. Get back onto your, your calorie numbers and make sure that you're getting them right because I've probably gotten lazy, which I did. It's like, all right, get, get back on your calorie numbers to make sure you're getting them right. Um, and then secondly, like try a different thing. So I was on, I was hitting 173 and four for like three weeks in a row. It's like, I can't get below this. I'm, I'm hitting a whole different problem. So I went for, I'm going to do a, a day where I don't eat any breakfast and don't eat any lunch. And I'll, I'll eat all of my calories at dinner. Well, when I'm only tracking one meal and I'm only mistaking, making mistakes in one meal, now I've only got like that one area where I might be fudging my numbers wrong. And all of a sudden I went right back down. So like if you look across the entire time, I'm weighing myself every day. I'm not seeing any changes. I'm not seeing any changes. I'm seeing an increase one day. And I'm like, all right, well, let's let's do it now instead of later when it's I'm now fully devastated because nothing's happened for two or three weeks. Mm -hmm. I do it at week one and week two. And at that point, it tipped back down, and I'm back on the exact same trend I've been on the entire time. The plateau, when you look across the graph, is like a little, and then it keeps going down the same way. So all that to say, I think the plateau being, letting it being an awareness point. Like, hey, I'm noticing that I'm not getting any losses. Reevaluate what you're doing. That's fine. It's fine to reevaluate what you're doing. I don't like it anymore. Okay, well, do you not like it anymore and the results aren't worth it? You're going to go straight back to eating whatever you want to eat. But if the results are worth it, and you don't like what you're doing anymore, 
change what you're doing that still gains the same results, which is still a calorie restriction. It's just being done in a different way. Right. I like it. I think all of our conversation today has been super, um, in my opinion, liberating. There is really only one thing that is important. It's calorie restriction. Mm -hmm. Everything else is whatever works for you. That's great. Like, how, how is that not the most And they liberating? all could. That's the other thing. Get off the hill. You don't need to be on a hill. Right. Unless you have some sort of dietary problem that says, I cannot do that diet. It, it hurts me. Like, you know, there are people that are gluten intolerant. There are people that lactose intolerant. There are people that can't digest certain foods. And so when you make, this is the only way to do this, is you have to have a carnivore-only diet. Well, great, because steak makes me have the worst uh, acid reflux I've ever had, and then I'm boiling my own esophagus. Well, I guess I can't lose weight. No, there's so many ways to skin this cat and, and then it, eat it. I, I really, uh, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> That's, is that what you've been doing? You, you just slip it in there. And you, cats? Uh, you would be surprised uh, at the protein. Very lean meat. <laughs> no, yucky. Just a joke. But yeah, don't eat cats. But really, though, it, it's kind of a, an insane thing that, it, to be honest, everybody needs to create their own game. You know, if if you play enough of the games and you realize what works for you, that's really what you need to be doing. But keep in mind the hierarchy of things. Would you need to calorie restrict if there wasn't so much food in your face? No. Would you even need to calorie restrict if all you had access to was lean meats and vegetables? Most likely, no. It's just naturally happening. Yeah. I don't have to think about it. This is a, your body's burning what it needs to. You're feeling completely satiated. You know, in the carnivore diet, another thing I learned in that was when you do eat an abundance of food and it's actually food that's super lean, I still struggled to get to my caloric intake. Mm -hmm. I was losing a lot of weight because I was tracking everything and I was struggling to get to 3,200 calories to maintain Just my weight. Just stuffing another thing of yeah, uh, beef in your face. I'm not eating another pound of ground beef today to get to my caloric intake. So, you know, you, you kind of learn that if you really just were eating good foods, you don't have to do any of this. You don't have to think about it All much. of the shenanigans are built around how do I get to eat a bunch of junk I and possibly consume some alcohol and then maybe have some desserts and still be super ripped right which is almost impossible because any one of those things are desserts and desserts by their very nature are in excess of your normal eating habits right but, wah, it, wah. but it, nonetheless i mean i don't really mean it as a depressing thing but understand the game and then when you know that you have excess fat as long as you continue to stick to a plan and you're doing what you're doing and add a little bit of variety you will get there and then when you get there continue measuring yeah, because as soon as you quit, you, you are gained eating twenty desserts. pounds, and <laughs> you are did did the person oh, have to do this all over again? Yeah, yeah, it, or no, be okay with that because yeah. that's my my spot is I am fine with gaining back ten pounds across the year. Now that does mean that I eat in a certain way. You know, I've learned my portion sizes and I've learned those things, and so I do that most of the year anyway. But when I get lazy and I don't keep tracking stuff, I slowly over the course of a year gain about ten pounds. Gaining ten pounds a year is a pretty normal thing that most people say that they end up doing. But if you take three months out of every year to go back down to the weight that you intended to be, you can gain 10 pounds every year of your life. I agree. And stay the same weight. That, that's uh, something that I, I think that I've been doing that as well. Uh, I don't really see how you can live life and enjoy and go on vacations or take some breaks from eating and not have bad choices. Because if you do, you will gain weight. It's that simple. Mm -hmm. The caloric intake the increase in caloric intake, eating foods that are delicious. And I, I mean, I get you can cook some healthy foods, extra good. They're not cake. Yeah. But if you're going to be eating cake, you're going to be in excess and you're going to gain weight. But if you continually get on like some kind of a cycle throughout the year of you're going to get, lose the body fat. But I would say one other suggestion in that is I believe everyone should get on the bandwagon of the scale mm -hmm. deal as well as a body fat caliber. Because if you don't, you'll find as you age that lean body mass number continually goes lower and your fat goes higher at the same weight. So if you're only using the scale and you get to that 210, what you'll find is that sooner or later in some of those years, you're going to get a little kick. You might be 212, you might be 214, and you can't seem to get rid of it quite as easy and you don't know why it's not getting to 210. It's actually a worse story than what you thought. 
you've lost lean body mass and you're not losing the fat. Mm. So every year you may be holding on to a half a pound more fat, three quarters of a, a pound of fat. You got to the same spot on the scale, so you didn't shed any right. more weight. Four years go down the road, man, I just can't lose this last five pounds. It's because you're fatter. It's, it's because all the previous years up to now, you've actually been losing lean mass and you've run out of lean mass to lose. Yeah, so it's it's rather important, I think, and this is new to me. This is the last 24, eh, probably not even that, maybe 16 months, I've started really looking at this body fat measuring process, uh, an intricate part of the game. My mm. game is scale in the morning, scale at night indefinitely. I will do it forever because I have had too many instances we're putting on 15 and 16 pounds, just not paying attention. Snuck up on you. Is not a f- not fun to lose that amount of fat. Mm-mm. Can it be done? Absolutely. Is it enjoyable? No. no. So, you know, I, I think that doing the body fat is a faster indication of, oh, you literally have gained the right thing? five pounds of fat. Right. Hold the phone. You know that's going to take you six weeks, don't you? Right. <laughs> I think that's the other thing too is I, I've talked to some other people that that have said to me, well, it, it's easy for you. You you know you've always stayed lean. Well, yeah, I've made choices that make me. I don't drink soda. I I mean I do eat cake, but when I eat cake, it's because I also didn't eat breakfast. You know, like it is true. It is easier for me because I have a certain number of habits that are just normal for me now. But the second part is it also sucks. Every spring sucks. Right. Make no mistake. It sucks. Like yeah. I'm hungry right now. I I want to eat right now. But I know that my goal is important and I want to keep that goal every year because I never want to get outside of my 10 pound range and I know that to keep my 10 pound range I got to get down to the bottom of the 10 pound range. So to me that's more important than how much it sucks right now. Mm-hmm. And as long as I know that it's going to suck every year it doesn't surprise me. Every spring's going to suck a little bit. Unfortunately, in my situation with more experience, I'm learning that I want it to suck less. Yeah. <laughs> so that's I'm not, not, but I'm not meaning like I'm trying after that one, I have gone less far. I'm oh, never, you're saying don't I'm, ever make it a, a 20. That's where Let's the body make it a 10. Let's yeah. Make it a five. Yeah. Cause when you really go off a of body fat and you find that you got your body fat up around 20, there is no fast track if that's your measurement. To get 5% off your body takes a really, really long time. Months. Yeah. And to me, I think it's it's a done deal. If I could work in, even if the 37-hour the fasting, if I do more testing and I can find that skipping a meal like once a month, twice a month, skip a day could give me the you, cushion you that you that, need. 3,500 calories out of the course of a month. If I did two days a month, that's literally almost two full pounds. Or take the other way. Let's not talk pounds. It's 7,000 calories of mistakes, mm-hmm. slight mistakes that I can make. You yeah. know, wh- whether I'm a little over here, right. whether I didn't quite get enough exercise in. Had, I a, par- a, s- had a birthday party I went to with a friend and, and drank more that, that weekend. Yeah, yeah, all of those things. I'm more interested in the template, not the day-to-day. Mm-hmm. So if in my template I can maintain body weight and I, I coach this all the time. I'm working with a, a good friend of mine now trying to get him um, to get in a healthy body range. And the template is what it's all about because it's the habits. Right. So You're it, building something that is sustainable beyond willpower. And, and let me just give you my template. Okay. Briefly. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the template that I'm coaching right now and that I think is insanely effective again, caliber restriction, numero uno, But what I'm preaching right now, scale in the morning, scale at night. High protein choices all the time, less carbohydrates. I would say next to no carbohydrates through breads and anything like that. Your general consensus is you should be eating meat and you should be eating vegetables a couple times a week, not even every day. And you can start eating from 12 to 8 p.m. Don't eat after that and eat about every two or three hours and make sure you stick to that schedule because in three weeks when you get that plateau Plateau, effect and you feel like dumpiness and you want to start skipping everything, you will prolong that window if you actually eat every two to three hours. And is this enjoyable or does it take a lot of planning? Absolutely. But if you don't want to be hungry, eating more frequently does work. Mm -hmm. If you start eating at 8 a.m., you will not have a calorie restriction by 8 p.m. So by shrinking that window, you can literally eat 
some pretty good choices from 12 on to about 8 o'clock, and you never really feel hungry as long as you can get rid of that breakfast hunger and spot. Your, and your and snacks, you can push that with caffeine. You know, drink some black like, coffee. Your snacks are like a stick, right? We're talking like a, a beef yeah, stick like or a, a handful of nuts. Like, we're talking like yeah, calorie, you know, not dense food. That just takes the the edge off. Yeah, have a protein shake, have a, a beef stick. Um, you could even do some lunch meat and cheese a little bit here and there. Um, I do a lot of like leftovers of what I have cooked the night before. So if we make tacos, I hold the shell on the taco, got my meat and got all my fixings on it. But now the next day for a snack, I might be having some of that taco meat again. Um, yeah, again, yeah. So overcook the dinners, come into the day, and again. This is fat loss world, right? Right. This is you're, this trying, is the game you're trying. I'm trying to lose weight. These are this is my plan to get there. And it, even if you you know a listener was going to say, well, what about your reflection? Well, in the reflection world, I would be adding in potentially a little bit more carbohydrates for like more sanity, and I would not be eating every two hours. Right. The only reason I'm eating every two to three hours is because I want to not be hungry. Right. And when you're going to roll a five to six to 700 calorie deficit, you're going you're to be gonna hungry. hungry. So if you kind of combine some of these aspects, I've found to be really successful. More frequency keeps the hunger away. Mm -hmm. It keeps you really on par with a plan. It doesn't get so spread out. Mm -hmm. You want to know why more frequency on weight training and working out is also beneficial? Because you got a really good plan. You got a really good plan and you don't fall off the bandwagon. Could you get re great results in two to three days? Absolutely. With a lot of intensity, you can get great results in two to three days. But if you only work out on Wednesday and Friday, there's a lot of days to not be thinking about working out and eating healthy. Anyway, so you would eat from that 12 to 8 window. And then at that night, when you go to bed at 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock, you want that number to be as close to your bottom number as possible. And what that number will do is it'll indicate to you whether or not you're eating healthy enough foods because it's impossible to eat a bunch of carbohydrates and hit that low number. If you eat too many carbohydrates, that number will be six, seven pounds higher. So by doing this, you're more or less playing a game that will put you in a hole that says, I have to eat these kind of foods to match those numbers. The more you match the first number, weight just falls off. Mm -hmm. Happens every time, like clockwork, every yeah. single time. Why protein? Protein from carnivore diets, keto, all these things. One of the biggest attributes they have is you're less hungry because you're eating more satiating foods. Protein mm -hmm. digests slower. We're not having swings in the insulin and all the glucose. So those kind of foods will satiate you longer. Right. That's why we're saying eat a protein thing every two, uh, three hours. Okay. Takes a little bit of planning. Overcook your dinners. Use them for snacks the next day. When you day. say overcook, you just mean make more. Yeah, make a lot don't, of quantity. Don't eat too many. Yeah, make your more. your intention is to make more and shelf it. Yeah, and even if you eat it like six, don't skip the eight o'clock meal because in the morning, in three weeks, you're going to start getting so hungry that you shouldn't have done it. And the dinner, you should eat as much as you want. You should feel satiated when you start getting in a good groove and you're eating the right things. If you want to eat twelve ounces of steak, go for it. Doesn't right. matter because once again, it's the it's a kind of food that's so calorie thin. Yeah. You're not having a problem. You're not overeating by 1,000 calories. Right. You're overeating by 200 calories. Now, this method is no counting, okay? Right. But counting is what you're doing. It's built into it. You're you're eating the things that needed to be eaten to get to the goal. You've basically done the calorie on the front end where you've made the food decision that will have a lower calorie number. Exactly. And then it's just simply, are you hitting the lowest number? Guess what? Eat less food. Right. Are you not hitting the low number? Okay, well, I just said that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If same. you don't if you don't hit the number, then you need to eat less food. So right. don't think about counting. Just you need to eat a little less food. Does it mean skipping one of the meals? Kind of depends. Mm -hmm. It's a slippery slope. You start skipping those meals, the hunger will get you in three weeks. Um, but if you can maintain that kind of a, a plan, it works really well. It works well for me for the last two years. That's the system I've been using. Um, and I don't know. I mean, I think everybody should try it. It's a little bit of piece of everything. But if yeah. you... Well, and you can you can plug in different um, food, like your your Gives idea you a is freedom. your idea is mostly clean food, which makes it and clean being just like this is mostly natural food, and the reason for that is it's not calorie dense. Right. So if you're changing anything in the in the plan that you did, you could just change what foods you're eating, but understand more calorie dense food will mean less food can be eaten. Right. Volume and density are, are intrinsically related.
Yeah. yeah I don't know. I, I think that that's one of the things that uh, I think testing should be just what everybody should be trying to test every single diet plan that interests you in the least bit as long as it Give lines it up with food that you like to eat. Well, I, I liked even kind of what you had said earlier where it's like uh, I realized after doing my 72-hour fast or, or what would you say? 37-hour. Yeah. Backwards it. Uh, after I did my 37 hour fast, I've never gone a whole day without eating, but like you, you can like, yeah, you're, you're allowed to, I think a lot of times people, especially when you get on a hilltop and you get on a camp, you protect these things that we don't know. Me personally, I don't know enough, learned it, don't remember it all, how the body, you know, breaks down different foods, create ATP and, and all the energy transition, like I could relearn it and it would it would come to me quickly, but I don't know know how it works right now. But I'm going to sit here and try and like defend my basal metabolic rate which will somehow go down if I don't eat every 2 hours. That's just not that's not accurate to I mean thousands of years of of human life. People have been starving for thousands of years throughout human existence and nobody became a fatty back in like you know, um, Neanderthal times and they're, we're hunting cats and, and not eating for a long time. Yeah. That just, it, it didn't happen. And the but, reason it didn't happen was because the body is made to not have food and then to have food by utilizing all these processes we're talking about tweaking to get fat loss and, fat, and, and, and weight gain that you're looking for. But it still is, you know, I think when you go down that road, that really leads into the longer term fast being a huge bonus and oh my gosh I, I just think it takes you down a slippery slope of thought process and sure where, like oh my gosh and and remember all those neanderthals lived to be 150 years old didn't yeah. they is that right uh, no 30 oh 30, they all died yeah, at 30 age of 30 yeah that's are you, really yeah so maybe paleo diet isn't the right way oh but it is to say that like your body didn't like nobody just dies because they didn't eat for 72 hours right we are not the rat right now you do get some some health markers that start going and changing. You do get some insulin levels that start changing. All those things start changing. But the main thing I'm kind of getting at is I, as a human, should not be afraid to just try something and see what happens. If, be adventurous. If you don't know what it's like to have a handful of peanuts, get rid of your cotton mouth that you've had. For Which makes three. no sense whatsoever. <laughs> I'm going to eat the saltiest food I can think of. and. Oh. I mean, it's it's kind of crazy though. It, if you don't know what that is, you have never lived. I'm no, telling never, you, it's, I've never lived. To, I'm just telling you, like one of the interesting observation that that led me to believe was there are so many benefits from cutting your carbohydrates that have been measured across the board. Fruits are fine, but even people have shown that you don't even have to eat any fruit and you're still perfectly healthy. Mm -hmm. Many, many types of studies that indicate that. Yeah. And what I find that's really interesting is that if one handful of peanuts got my mineral levels to do what they needed to do to get rid of the dire thirst, just, man, cotton mouth, smacking my lips, drinking tons of water, to have that go away from a handful of peanuts. And people may not believe it, but I I did it twice in the cycle at the end when I got to, because I was so tired of Cottonmouth. And uh, it worked both times for about 72 hours, about two, three days right in there on that third day. And if that doesn't make you think, well, how much broccoli do I really need to eat? No. How much protein? No. Do I really need to eat? When a handful can swing your, uh, I mean, think about the people that are, that are, you know, you get told to eat or drink plenty of fluids when you're um, sick and everything, not just water because you'll float your electrolytes and you'll, you'll get really, really sick. You know, most people, if you hand them a Gatorade can fix that really, really water sick problem that they have by just one Gatorade. That's all it took. And now your mineral, your essential minerals are all back in, in swing. Right. Like, that's it. We're talking micro problems. Well, it, slight deficit. Now, it didn't take much to get you out of it. And it'll kill you. You can die on that deficit. Right. Meow. All better. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. So the, all that to say, like, we are so much more robust than I think we, that we give ourselves credit for in some of these diets that we come up with. We're coming up with these diets to trick our bodies to do a thousand different things. We're coming up with these diets to, 
you know, um, confuse the, the system that burns fat. We're, there's so many reasons and ways that we're coming up with these diets. But in reality, the diet is what the diet is. And your body is a lot more resilient than what we give it credit for. And you're not going to ruin it by having a, a cheat meal in a, in a, in a weekend, as long as you know that you had a big enough deficit to account for it throughout the week. Would, wouldn't it just be better to know that the, the cheat meal, sure, have the cheat meal. But, but know about it ahead of time. But don't forget that whatever your surplus is, it is, in fact, a surplus. Mm -hmm. I mean, I struggled with that a long time. They say I can have a cheat meal. I'm measuring everything. I'm not really seeing how this is not actually going into my numbers. Uh, it's not a get out of jail free card. It mm -hmm. literally equates to cal calories that I have to burn. And mm -hmm. I remember measuring that over and over. And I utilize cheat meals because it is. I'm a glutton. I love them. I was going to say, so what it is is people that do the cheat meals and it works for them are just not committed to cheating as hard They're as you They're just were. not cheating like I am. They're doing it all wrong. <laughs> They're doing it all wrong. I mean, if you're going to cheat, then you got to go cheat. for it. Like the Rock's version of his cheat meals. I don't know if you've ever seen these things, I'm but not. they're like these glorious deals where he's eating like a pan full of cookies and blah, blah, blah. I'm like, yeah, it looks like a what it's supposed to be. So that That's not that, that looks outrageous. Like cheat. That looks like Fridays. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's just kind of funny. Like, if you knew that the cheat meal wasn't a get out of jail free card and you knew that the rock potentially with his workload, how much he's moving, he's acting, he's on his feet nonstop. He's working out like a, you know, freight train every single morning that you're seeing him on his Instagram. You're seeing all that stuff. He's most likely eating in a deficit to be able to absorb that. A cheat meal. Yep. To get into a, depends what he's doing. Is he cutting? Is he maintaining? Is he gaining? You know, just like fat loss, fat loss requires a deficit. How do you think you build muscle? You have to have a caloric surplus mm -hmm. or a protein surplus to jump into the protein synthesis processes to even be able to gain the muscle. Right. So it kind of just depends on which process you're trying to. So he can which, be, What are we juggling? He here? can show this great cheat meal thing, but it's it's on the it's on the months that he's doing his build. Yeah. All right. So you got a great. Well, he does build. it all the time. But oh, it, no, but it, I'm it, saying the really big ones. We're like, how can someone eat that much? What's well, because it might be during his, his build time. His nine to five too, though. His deficit may be able to absorb. Mm -hmm. I mean, you think about it. If you take a general cheat type of a meal, most people are probably only going to be able to eat a day's worth of calories probably in that window because it's going to be super calorically high foods. So say you were eating, in my world, you probably eat 5,000 calories pretty easily. In a cheat meal. In a cheat meal day. Yeah, I'm going to smash all kinds of food and I'm going to have desserts. Yes, probably I can do that. Five to six thousand calories and you divide them out if yeah. your deficit absorbs that or your exercise absorbs that maybe that sunday you know that you're gonna have your cheat meal you're out doing 20 miles on a bike and you don't normally do 20 miles on a bike well well keep in mind subtract. also 20 20 miles on a bike is probably only 500 calories <laughs> yeah, it's maybe, not much. maybe that's it's a, really that depressing I might, I might be overshooting that it's really depressing to compare exercise calories to food calories. Here's the deal. I feel like, and I feel like we could talk about this kind of thing like constantly. Like yeah, we could come back to this. We could continue talking about it for hours because I do think that this is just something that it's it's intrinsically uh, interesting. We And it's something that we all have an opinion on because we all eat it's and It's a problem live. that everybody has. We live through this scenario, not even problem, but this scenario and, uh, and so everyone kind of has skin in the game on, on the conversation altogether. And I, and I don't think it's a bad conversation to have. And I think we haven't even brushed the surface of things. Thanks a lot for listening to the show today. I'd really appreciate if you'd like the video, if you found value in it, and subscribe to the channel, clicking that notification bell so you also receive notifications for future videos that could help you out as well. If you have any questions about the content, leave a comment below and I'll be sure to interact with you as quickly as possible there. I've created a website called kbandstraining.com in 2010. We've been around for a long time with high quality resistance bands and durable equipment. I also have provided nearly 1,100 drills and videos for fitness training and athlete performance for youth athletes. So support my work. If you enjoy the content and you'd like me to continue doing what I'm doing, I would love the support. Thanks a lot for listening.